from the IMF. We will wait to see. I can guarantee you, if the president fails to do the needful, clearly, Ghanaians are going to hold him accountable. And the conclusion, as far as the good people of Ghana are concerned, is going to be simple. That Akufuado, the MPP, is presidential candidate Baumia, are of LGBTQI activities in the Republic of Ghana. Parliament of the Republic of Ghana did not pass proper human sexual rights and Ghanaian family value bill. Parliament of Ghana passed a bill different from what they are saying. There is nothing said in their letter that directly relates to the bill. They might not be able, that's what the, bill, the letter says, they might not be able to get the money required under IMF. What is the reason? The reason is not there. But as to why, under the IMF that we are now, whether we have categorically signed an agreement with IMF that the government will ensure that the bill is not passed into law is something that beats my imagination. And I'm inclined to say that uh, I will least expect government of the Republic of Ghana under Nana Akufuado to go and sign an agreement with AMF that a bill before Parliament, he will ensure that that particular bill is not passed into law. I want them to Well, after all of this is said and done, the President had a message for the diplomatic community, which we will get into. Good morning from our studios here at Adesawe in Accra. I welcome you to The Key Point here on TV3, also live on 3FM 92.7, TV3 Ghana on Facebook, DSV channel 279, all across the world on 3news.com. We're also live on, also on uh, TV3 Ghana on X, as well as on Instagram, and a number of radio stations across the country. This is the most topical issues platform of the week with a well-informed guest who's going to be joining us in a bit. And just to remind you that we are very, very interactive this week. Pressure is mounting on President Kufuado to sign into law that anti-LGBTQ plus bill, which was recently passed by Ghana's eighth parliament. Now, the president, in interaction with the members of the diplomatic community, few days ago assured that Ghana will not backslide on its human rights record. Whatever that means, but he actually insisted that he was awaiting the outcome of a Supreme Court suit challenging the constitutionality of that particular anti-LGBTQ plus bill. So, does the president have that time to, as it were, wait for the outcome of that Supreme Court suit. Or per the constitutional provisions, he has the next two, three weeks to also make a decision or determination on what next he wants to do, whether to sign or not to sign and communicate same to parliament, for parliament to also know what to do next. We will get into the constitution and what the law specifically states and take all sides of this particular conversation into consideration about the anti-LGBTQ plus bill this morning. It has a religious angle, a financial angle, because of what the finance ministry said this week about the financial possible financial implications if this becomes law. We'll touch on it as well. And then we'll get into the social angle, the political angle as well. So there are four various angles of this conversation of the anti-LGBTQ plus bill, which we will be considering in our conversation this morning. Also, the flag bearer of the NDC, John Dramani Mahama, has maintained Professor Nana Jin Opokwajiman as his running mate for the 2024 presidential election. Today on the show, We'll find out what impact she's likely really to bring on board as the NDC prepares to face off with the NPP in this year's general election to be held on, on the 7th of, of December. Remember that this is not the first time the pair 
are going to lead the NDC into a crucial election. The first was in the year 2020. What is going to be done differently this time around? And the MPP is also looking at what is happening within the, N the NDC. How is that going to influence their choice or otherwise of a running mate for Dr. Mahmoud Obamia? Now, we have a conversation this morning here on the key point. Another item that we have on, on the table of the menu that we're serving you is the decision by some NDC MPs to defy security presence and symbolically commission the National Cathedral project, which is still at the foundation level. Now, we'll also look at the, the roadmap agreed by the political parties and the Electoral Commission for the 2024 election, which is only nine months away. This is, this is a key issue as well, because two days ago, the Interparty Advisory Committee reached some very crucial decisions. In fact, a consensus reached after a very long period of back and forth uh, with the Electoral Commission. In fact, you know, some level of candor and tolerance. Well, while we're at it, we're counting the days to election 2024 here on your election command center. On behalf of the rest of the team, I want to say thank you. Thank you very much for joining us this morning here on the key point here. We talk about the key issues that are of concern to you, the Ghanaian people, and we go straight to the point with our guests. Today we have a special package for you on the key point. I'll tell you right after this quick break, my guests will join me. I am Alfred Akansi. Welcome to the key point. Good morning. You know, one bucket of Flamingo paint is equal to several buckets of any other paint brand on the market. Flamingo paint, superior durability, superior hiding, superior coverage. Flamingo paint, simply superior. You know, one bucket of Flamingo paint is equal to several buckets of any other paint brand on the market. Flamingo paint, superior durability, superior hiding, superior coverage. Flamingo paint, simply super. Mm. Colgate Herbal is formulated from unique natural herbs to strengthen teeth and keep gums healthy. Try Colgate Herbal, scientifically proven for strong teeth and healthy gums. This advert is FDA approved. This new year, GoTV is stepping up your entertainment at no extra cost to you. Yahoo! If you're on GoTV Value, upgrade to GoTV Plus and watch GoTV Max already on GoTV Plus. Then upgrade to GoTV Max to enjoy GoTV Super. And if you're on GoTV Max, upgrade to GoTV Super to enjoy the best of the best on GoTV Super Plus. Don't wait for the best sport, international entertainment and local shows. Step up today. It's on us. GoTV. This is Hot Issues, your passport to the most compelling conversations of our time. We go one-on-one -on -one with the movers and shakers, the thought leaders and the game changers. We ask the questions that matter and we don't back down. Tonight on Hot Issues, I sit with the man at the center of corruption investigations. Join me on Hot Issues here on TV3. Hot Issues show Sundays at 10 p.m. only on TV3. TV3, first in news. I am Cookie and I bring you Today's Woman every Saturday right here on TV3. And this Saturday on Today's Woman, we're speaking to Mame Ajwa Thompson. She's an entrepreneur and a business leader with 12 years of experience in the financial market. I sat before the MD and I told him that, sir, it's global market or nothing. If you're not taking me there, I think I can do very well for the bank in that space. And he looked at me and he said, are you sure? And I said yes. Well, she brought a special, special tricky game that both of us played. You want to find out who won? Securities. Securities. <laughs> Mommy. Well, join me right here next week, Saturday at 3 p.m. here, TV3. It is Today's Woman with me, Cookie. 
Today's Woman with Cookie Tea show Saturdays at 3 p.m. on TV3. Brought to you by Latex Foam. This call. We hear so many times that a gentleman or a lady has been abused. My aunt began touching me and started pursuing me into sex. Hmm. It worried me and scared me from the beginning. Oh no, it's not done anywhere. It's I won't not. agree on this. Mm. Taking care of your own family member should be done voluntarily and for yes. free. I was thinking maybe there's something this woman is doing behind the scene that demands that. First of all, it's not good for the, the young boy's mental health. Um, health. And this woman too must be sick ah. to have done that to her own nephew. We should begin to educate them from a very tender age, age. that this is your private part. Mm. This is for you alone. Mm. You have the right to allow who to touch you at what time. But even that one, you have to be 18 years and above. And being abused, we hear of it by your own relative and a woman for that matter. I mean, what's happening in this world? Confessions shows on Saturdays at 9.30 p.m. on TV3. Brought to you by MTN. Mac Brown's Kitchen. I can't depend on Mac Brown's Kitchen. I'm ready to say me the Mac Brown's Kitchen. Mac Brown. New season, new stations. Hey, Mara. Hey, Mac Brown's Kitchen. Yo, na na yomu mati bi swache. Ani yo, muhu yache. Bandi enyami ayeni. Encha kwa ano. Eh, but TV three. Me me debia. Ani five to six pm. Na na yaba shamu wati. Me ni nukuna ni me ma yaba shamu sasa ko. McBrown's Kitchen shows this and every Saturday at 5 p.m. on TV3. Brought to you by Baherbao. Akuma Onion Paste. The 3FM Gobe Festival 2024. Gobe Lovers and Gobe Eaters Association. Time now so Get ready for the biggest Gobe event in Ghana. On Saturday, 16th March at the Akramo Interchange Park. From 9 a.m., come experience a food festival interlaced with fun activities and music performances like never before. Be there to savor different flavors and combos of Gobe, like Gobe and rice or Gobe and kinky. Throw some pepper on the side, avocado in the center center. And eggs on the top corner. Or Bodo! Last year was terrific. This year will be a showdown. Don't miss out on the gastronomic delights and vibrant atmosphere. Are you a gobe seller or you know anyone? Call now to register 0532-200927 or 0531-100927. Let's link up the 3FM Gobe Festival 2024. Your Gobe joins the B. Join us on Saturday, 16th March at 9 a.m. and let's transform their Cromwell Interchange Park into a Gobe Lovers Paradise. 3FM 92.7, your urban lifestyle radio station. Sponsored by Global App, Bigo Drinks, Inkulenu Foods, Fidelity Bank, Gino Tomato Paste, Dewa Chop Money, Flora Tissues, Sankofa Natural Spices. Get ready for an epic adventure. Join TV3 on a two-day expedition of the Western Wonders of Ghana as part of the Ghana Month celebration happening from Friday 29th to Saturday 30th of March. This is Journey to the West. Explore the rich history of Cape Coast Castle. Walk through the last forest of Kaku. Witness the breathtaking in Zulezu Stilt Village for a journey through time. Immerse yourself in the magic of bonfires, groove to sensational music performances and experience the beats with DJs on rotation, indulge in mouth-watering dishes and refreshing drinks while creating unforgettable memories. Don't miss the chance to celebrate Ghana's beauty and culture. Join us for two days filled with adventure, culture and a whole lot of fun. Journey to the West. To book a seat for this Odyssey, call 0264-932732. It's Journey to the West. Hashtag Ghana Month Celebration. Hashtag Journey to the West. Hashtag Explore Ghana. To you by Malta Guinness. You have twenty seconds to solve these questions. What is the largest glandular organ in the human body? Liver. The liver is correct. Yeah. 
The vitamin which is essential for blood clotting is? Vitamin K. Vitamin K is the right answer. C-A dash O-L dash. J-N-E. J-N-E, the word being? Kajo. Kajo, very good. It's a country's flag. You need to give me the name of the country, please. Cambodia. Cambodia is correct. The temperature of a gas is a measure of... Average kinetic energy. You are correct. Which of the following represents a billion characters? Mana. Gigabyte. You're correct. You're correct. The Shark Season 7 shows Sundays at 2 p.m. only on TV3. The news never stops. If it's not breaking, developing, the news lends itself to significant analysis, broad context through explainers and the features that give stories more life. That's what we offer on Weekend Central. News, features, analysis, the full package. Weekend Central, Saturdays and Sundays at 12 p.m. on TV3. TV3, first in news. I'm aware that last week's bipartisan passage by Parliament of the proper human sexual rights and Ghanaian family values bill on a private member's motion has raised considerable anxieties in certain quarters of the diplomatic community and among some friends of Ghana that she may be turning her back on her hitherto enviable long-standing record on human rights observance and attachment to the rule of law. I want to assure you that no such backsliding will be complete, contemplated or occasioned. I think it will serve little purpose to go at this stage into the details of the origin of this proposed law, which is yet to reach my desk. But suffice it to say that I have learned that today a challenge has been mounted at the Supreme Court by a concerned citizen to the constitutionality of the proposed legislation. In the circumstances, it would be as well for all of us to hold our hands and await the decision of the court. Well, so that's President Kofuado uh, during the week when he was addressing the diplomatic community in fact, just ahead of our Independence Day celebration. That statement that he made is what has been subjected to a lot of conversation uh, throughout the week, leading up to today. If you're just joining us, this is Key Point here on TV3. We're also live on 3FM 92.7. Also on uh, TV3 Ghana on Facebook, DSTV channel 279, all across the world on freenews.com. We're also live on a number of radio stations across the country on Kiss Me 107.1 in Tamil and W93.5 in WA and beyond. Now, my guests will be joining me in a bit. We'll, we'll start this conversation, but just take a look at this. This is what the president said in text. And various aspects of the conversation will subject to some analysis this morning. Uh, the specific issues that the president put out earlier today. He says that he is aware that last week's bipartisan passage by parliament of the proper human sexual rights and Ghanaian family values bill on a private member's motion has raised considerable anxieties in certain quarters of the diplomatic community and amongst some friends of Ghana that she may be turning her back, that is Ghana may be turning our back on them. Hitherto, enviable, long-standing record on human rights, observance, and attachment to the rule of law. The president assures, or he, he said he would want to assure them, the diplomatic community, that no such backsliding will be contemplated or occasioned. He continues, 
that he, quote, I think it will serve little purpose to go at this stage into the details of the origin of this proposed law. So take note of that. The details of the origin of this proposed law. And what, what's the origin? The origin is that it emanated from a private member's motion. And you know the conversation we've had about laws in the view of the president that have financial implications, possible financial implications emanating through a private member's motion. It says that the details of this proposed law, which is yet to reach his desk, so what is the status of this anti-LGBTQ plus bill that was approved by parliament? Is yet to reach his desk. So what happens next? He says, but suffice to say that I have learned that today a challenge has been mounted at the Supreme Court by a concerned citizen to the constitutionality of the proposed legislation. In the circumstances, it will be as well for all of us to hold our hands and wait for the decision of the Supreme Court before any action is taken. The operation of the institutions of the Ghanaian state will determine the future trajectory of the rule of law and human rights compliance in our country. So that's what the president talks about. Now, the various aspects of this bill that has been approved by parliament, which has been the concern of those who are opposed to it, or those who have raised concerns about certain aspects of, of this bill that has been approved by parliament, is what we'll get into in a bit. The specific punitive measures in there. Questions have been raised as to why persons found to be engaged in LGBTQ activities should be subjected to a jail term for that matter. Or why should people be imprisoned for their sexuality? That's what the likes of um, the CDD and some other 18 society organizations have been raising fundamental concerns about. And they have indicated their preparedness to go to the Supreme Court to also challenge aspects of this of this bill. Now joining me in studio is Member of Parliament for the North Town constituency. He's the ranking on the Foreign Affairs Committee of the Eighth Parliament of the Republic of Ghana. He has been a minister in a number of portfolios for today because of the conversation we're going to be having a former deputy education minister deputizing one who has been selected as the running mate for John Dramani Mahama. I'm not talking about the Honorable Samuel Okujato Ablakwa is joining us. Good morning to you. Good morning Alfred, good to see you. It's good to see you. It's been almost, what, a year since you appeared on this platform? Yes. It's been, been over a year <laughs> since you appeared on, on Key Point. Mm -hmm. what, what have you been up to? It's, it's great to very, be back. It's great to be back indeed. My pet took a lot of you, your attention. Yeah. How yeah. are the people doing? We are pulling through, doing our best to um, ensure that we are able to restore the dignity of our compatriots uh, who uh, have lost everything because of the uh, spillage from the Akosan work bomb dams by the VRA, which really um, is a national disaster. Uh, even though North Town is the epicenter, there are many other constituencies affected. So it's really a national disaster. And I must add that um, so far, uh, the good people of this country have been very kind to us. Uh, tremendous, you know, benevolence, goodwill, compassion, um, uh, reaching out to us, whether mm. as corporate Ghana, as foundations, individuals, families. And so that has helped us to so far house 600 
of these displaced people. We've done two major resettlement projects. Mm. Uh, the sad uh, thing, however, is that we still have a lot of our compatriots living in tents as we speak, six months now. There are so persons yeah. living in tents? Yes, These... about 2,000 people were still 2,000 people? Yes, are still living in tents because the, the disaster was on such a huge scale. In my constituency alone, you have uh, uh, about 12,633 people displaced. NADMO mm. says that uh, they counted about uh, 1,500 homes totally, you know, uh, either damaged or submerged and therefore crumbled mm. under the high waters. Um, so um, these are people who are now living in abject destitution, living like refugees uh, in these tents. And, and that's why there is a need to have, you know, a humanitarian response and to urge the government to wake up to uh, their obligations. I'm glad that finally the president um, uh, spoke about mm -hmm. the ongoing crisis during the uh, six March address. I did criticize him. Yes, when, you raised concerns when, that he did when, not talk about it during the state of the nation. About it during the message uh, on the state of the nation. So I'm glad that he made amends, uh, except that when he said that 80 million cities. Uh, yes, has, in fact, has, let, has let's, been released. I, I want us to, <laughs> we, to play that. Let, we, let's we hear all have specifically. Been, has been released to who and to do what? Yeah, that's a question I wanted to ask you because let, let's hear exactly what the president said about Mepe during the Independence Day uh, celebration, the speech that he delivered, specifically about Mepe and how much money had been released because of the concerns that you had raised that, that Mepe, the Akosombo spillage disaster did not find any space in the President's State of Nation address just about a week ago. This is what the President said during the week about Mepe. Take a look. I must at this stage reaffirm government's continued commitment to providing the support for victims of the recent extensive flooding in downstream communities in the Great Accra, Eastern and Volta regions caused by the spillage of the Akosombo Dam last year, a necessary action which was taken to maintain the dam's structural integrity. As set out in the 2024 budget, government has set aside 220 million CDs, of which 80 million CDs has already been released by the Ministry of Finance to support the ongoing rehabilitation efforts for the affected communities. Government will stop at nothing to restore normalcy to the lives and livelihoods of all affected persons. So that's the president there. But at this point, let me also welcome Dr. Enoch MP, who is a governance and leadership expert. Um, is the dean of the business uh, school of business and communications at the Academy City University. Dr. Enoch MP, it's good to have you. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning, Alfred. I'm thrilled to be here, as always. Also uh, joining us, and the Honorable Andy Apiakubi is a member of Parliament for the Asantia Chim North Constituency Office of the NPP. He's a private legal practitioner. He's going to be joining us in a bit. But also, Bobby Bansing is a private legal practitioner. He's joining us on Zoom. Martin Pebo as well is going to be joining us uh, as a private legal practitioner as well. I have a, a, a team of lawyers this morning because of the, the legal issues we're going to be talking about, just for the benefit of our viewers. So. Mr. Blackwa, this is the president saying that 80 million out of the 220 million as announced in the 2024 budget has been released for the, the relief of the people, including those in your constituency who are affected by this spillage. What do you know about this? <clears throat> well, this information came to us as a surprise. I must be very honest with you. Um, I have, in the circumstance, filed an urgent question uh, seeking clarity. Um, you found an urgent question? Yes, um, seeking clarity um, on this uh, release. Mm -hmm. Who was it released to? Because um, the president only said that released by the finance ministry mm -hmm. didn't indicate the destination. Who was it released to and what is it being used for? Um, is it a case that it was released just probably a few hours before his address and that's why we haven't uh, seen any concrete uh, development on the ground in terms of what the money is being used for because um, you do know that so far in terms of rehabilitation construction wise to resettle the displaced persons uh, nothing has started from the point of uh, government uh, all the 
displaced homes uh, that we have constructed um, have been done by us, you know, private-led initiative um, superintended by the MP's office. Um, then if you look at um, what uh, has come in in terms of uh, support for uh, livelihoods, they've largely uh, been driven by NGOs such as uh, the Red Cross, uh, uh, the World Food Program, uh, the, um, the UNICEF, uh, and, 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 and other groups in that, in that nature. The, um, the, 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 the Muslim Council internationally have also come in uh, to assist and they are helping with stipends. Uh, and so it, it will be really important to know um, exactly uh, the destination for that release. Who was it released to? What is it being used for? Is it the case that it's just probably a very recent release and so uh, it's now going to uh, materialize in, in, in actual terms on the ground? We will have to know. So I'm sure that as um, we follow through with this urgent question and we seek clarity uh, from ministers of state, uh, things will be put in, in, proper, in proper perspective. But as I said, I welcome the president's um, uh, uh, final uh, statement on this matter because I thought it was an aberration, mm -hmm. uh, quite an unpardonable one, that he uh, totally ignored the matter during the State of the Nation address. Uh, I, I must say that uh, so far, if we look at the response rate, I think that lessons have, have to be learned. I, I have read the very incisive uh, article on the matter by the respected uh, Colonel Festus Abwaji, who, who has asked that uh, we need to draw lessons in terms of how we respond when it comes to these, these disasters, that we have to be prepared. Speaking from the perspective of parliament, it is for this reason that under Article 177 of the Constitution, we have a contingency fund so that when these disasters, these emergencies occur, there will be a fund to take care of them. And I kept uh, reiterating, if you recall, that in 2023, we approved about 533 million in the contingency fund. In 2024, there's another billion cities in the contingency fund. And the reason why we have the contingency fund, now if you look at the provisions of the constitution, the government can even spend once there's an emergency, you just have to come to parliament and account, make sure that the finance committee of parliament has information and has the details of that expenditure so that, you know, things can go faster than the normal, you know, everyday uh, expenditure of government. It's not clear what happened, why the contingency fund was not brought to bear uh, to really ameliorate the plight of these victims. But uh, as academics and researchers uh, assess the situation, uh, as governance experts look at the various shortfalls and advise leadership on how to learn lessons moving forward, because nobody can really uh, uh, say that there wouldn't be disasters in the future. Uh, so what's really crucial is that lessons are learned and we have a different attitude moving forward to make sure that our response rate is fast and that we are able to move in and really let the people have confidence in, uh, in government, in their own nation, that when you've paid your taxes, when you have done all you must do as a citizen, when you've had to even bear the brunt so that all of us who have electricity, because we are told that if there was no spillage, the structural integrity of the dam will have been affected. The, uh, the dam will probably be no more now and will have <laughs> an even bigger crisis without electricity. So these people are taking a bullet for all of us, you know, if you like. And I think that we can be more uh, compassionate, more caring, and more responsive. But having said that, uh, I would like to emphasize all of what the good people of this country have done. Um, the national chief imam, he's been phenomenal with his support. And that's why we named a whole block after him uh, when we commissioned uh, the resettlement project. Because uh, he's visited thrice and he's followed up to really uh, pray for people and to offer financial support relief items. And I, I, I am in total uh, uh, admiration for what he did. The Christian Council of Ghana, uh, the Ibrahim uh, Mahama Foundation, uh, First Sky Group, 
uh, McDan and so many other companies, um, which you know, over 263, I think, at the last count. And we have been acknowledging them uh, very transparently. We set up an accountability elders council, so uh, they receive every donation. They are signatories to the account. I am not a signatory. And um, uh, they will soon be publishing a very comprehensive report on uh, everything that came in together with audited accounts. So. Uh, uh, we, we really have the good people of this country to thank, and you in the media, I mean, media general, you have been absolutely amazing in your, uh, your support, consistently highlighting the plight of these displaced persons. And, but for the coverage you gave us, I don't think that you'll have brought that attention that we needed. So um, we, we, are, we, we owe the media a debt of gratitude as well. So all the, the, so far, the interventions we've seen are by private persons. No, nothing from government so far? Yes, I'm sure the president will have talked about it if really there were specific, concrete um, interventions. That's why he says that they have released funds mm -hmm. to support rehabilitation. Um, we will have to be told exactly what that means. But if you look at the urgent needs of the people, which is uh, housing, resettlement, and compensation, that has not uh, been addressed. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, as I said, I think that the urgent question I have filed will mm -hmm. bring clarity, will offer some sunshine. So, the, the, is the urgent us. question is about the 80 million? Yes, yes. Who and was it released to? Who what, was it released to? Yeah, what, what is it supposed to be used for? Mm -hmm. So that, you know, as members of parliament, we can follow up, we can track, carry out our oversight mandate. And then, as uh, uh, constituents expecting this relief, we can also know exactly uh, what to do. Because remember that my chiefs had offered land mm -hmm. um, free of charge if anybody wants to come and uh, construct resettlement homes. And those lands are available. They've not, uh, apart from what we did with uh, uh, private uh, uh, benevolent organizations and mm -hmm. ind individuals, those lands are still available for government's use. And they remain unencumbered. There's no uh, project that has... Uh, begun on, on those pieces of land. So we'll follow up and see what exactly um, the 80 million is supposed to be used for. Thank you very much for this uh, information and then also reaction to what the President said during this, the Independence Day celebration. Let me welcome at this point the Member of Parliament for the Asantiachim North constituency on the ticket of the end people who is seeking re-election on December 7. He is a private legal practitioner you know, on the Apia Kubi. Uh, it's good to have you again. Good morning. Good morning, my brother. A very good morning to my constituents in Asante Achimno also. Indeed. It's, thank you so much for making the time to be here. Also, with us this morning is Sheikh Arimiao Shaibo, who speaks for the National Chief Imam. Sheikh, Assalamu alaikum to you. Wa alaikum salam. Good morning to my, my, my friends here. Good morning. Good to see you, <laughs> Sheikh. Good to see you. Yes, uh, just when you were seated, the Honorable Samuel Okudi Trablakwa talks about the contribution of the Chief Imam to also uh, the relief efforts in Mepe specifically. Thank you for making the time to be here. Thank you. Bobby Bunsen, a private legal practitioner, is also joining us on Zoom. Well, Bobby Bunsen, good morning. Good morning, Alfred. Um, hope you can hear me. I can hear you very, very well and clear. And I can see you as well. Uh, thank you very much for joining us this morning. So let's take a listen again, to, specifically to what the president said to the diplomatic community within the week about this anti-LGBTQ plus bill, which has been approved by parliament. Take a look. I'm aware that last week's bipartisan passage by Parliament of the proper Human Sexual Rights and Ghanaian Family Values Bill on a private member's motion has raised considerable anxieties in certain quarters of the diplomatic community and among some friends of Ghana that she may be turning her back on her hitherto enviable long-standing record on human rights observance and attachment to the rule of law. I want to assure you that no such backsliding will be complete 
contemplated or occasioned. I think it will serve little purpose to go at this stage into the details of the origin of this proposed law, which is yet to reach my desk. But suffice it to say that I have learned that today a challenge has been mounted at the Supreme Court by a concerned citizen to the constitutionality of the proposed legislation. In the circumstances, it would be as well for all of us to hold our hands and await the decision of the court before any action is taken. So that's President Kufado uh, there. Now, some aspects of this speech gives indicators or pointers of what is going to be happening in the coming days about the origin of this bill which has been approved by Parliament and then also the fact that whatever happens, we're not going to slide on our, on our human rights record as a country. And those are the issues that the persons who are opposed to this bill have been raising as to how this impacts on our human rights record as a country. Now, uh, let me start off with you, uh, uh, Dr. Enokenji on this matter, because I know, Professor, Professor Enoch, I beg your pardon, <laughs> forgive me, I, I, I know over the period since 2017, you have been engaging the likes of uh, the proponents of this bill Yes. over the period. Now, if you hear the concerns specifically that have been raised and the indicators that the president also gives, now, what should be the focus of leadership in addressing the issue so as not to have this bill passed into law and then we have a lot to deal with when it comes to lawsuits. Thank you, Alfred. I think that uh, from 2017, like you said, I met uh, Moses Fuamoni and Dr. Apia Kubi, uh, who was then the dean at the Dominion University College. And we met at a dorm radio and we're talking about that. Uh, perhaps I'm one of the few people in this country who know a lot about this. Because I thought this, I thought diversity in U.S. for a long time. And uh, when we're talking about pieces of it, now even as I write emails uh, in U.S., I have to put my pronoun. is he, him, his, or she, her, hers. Because you have to state your pronoun for students to know where you stand. Other than that, you will be charged for microaggression. 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 What does that mean? So, microaggression means that you are being aggressive towards one's, you know, sexual orientation. I see. So you have to state your pronoun in every email that you write. So these things that we are talking about here, I don't know why we did not bring in the experts to talk about it, but I'm glad that I'm here. Everything in politics, when we talk about leadership, is about framing. So we have to talk about policies should be framed in a way which is moral. And the policy should also be framed in a way which is moral. I like the way this bill was framed. The sexual, human sexual rights and family values. So what is our values as a people? And sometimes I hear a lot of people say, this person is an NDC, this person is an MPP. It doesn't matter. My hero in politics is John McCain. And John McCain, who was you know, a senator from Arizona, he was a prisoner of war, he was a Republican. But any time that there was a bill in parliament that he disapproves of it, he votes against it. Mm -hmm. That is me. So it doesn't matter whether one belongs to an NDC or MPP. We should say the facts because the facts always stand tall. Now, I've seen a lot of individuals coming with a lot of things. So let's talk about the LGBT. As I speak now, even the, we, we know the lesbians, the gays, the transgenders, and then uh, Others, but queer people and the intersex people, we are still researching on that even in the US. Mm -hmm. There was a lady in Minnesota who was pregnant for nine months, had a baby, and then the guy said that he's not a father. So they did a DNA test. When we, the results came in, the guy was the father, but the woman who carried the baby in her womb for nine months was not the mother. The woman who carried the baby in her womb for nine months was not the mother of the child. Intersex. So it's a very complicated thing that when you are talking about these issues, you will see that there are a lot of ambiguities, and that is when lawyers come in. And I understand perfectly how th this works. Mm -hmm. One day I was teaching uh, diversity, and a student came to me and asked me, Prof. E, 
Do you know how we orient? It's not that a gay person loves any person they meet, but they meet somebody the same way that a man meets a woman and then you love, they also meet somebody and then they love that person. And they asked me about my opinion. And I told them that, well, I don't have any problem with somebody's orientation. But for me, with all the beautiful women around, why would I orient towards another man? Okay. That was my opinion, and that's right. how I was able to save myself. So let me put this in this perspective. A bill is initiated by individuals or a group. Now, if you look at this bill, it was sponsored by traditional and religious leaders, right? So traditional and religious leaders of this country sponsored this bill. In fact, they supported it. So they supported have, it and they, a, they initiated the idea. Seven members of parliament. Yes. Yeah. Including uh, one MPP MP. Yes. This is Reverend Intim Fodjo, yes. who is a deputy education minister. Yes. yes. And he's a reverend as such. Yes. yes. And then um, Sam George, and then Nelson Ross and Dafia Mekpo. Uh, Nabu Bendra, Delasoa. Yes. Delasoa. Yes. Mm. So the, the title is that proper human sexual rights, that in this country, Ghana is a sovereign country. This is properly how we should orient our sexes. Mm -hmm. Now, I am an Adventist, and my grandmother who raised me was an apostolic. Any time, any Saturday that I go to church, my grandmother would tell me that he who feeds you controls you. Mm -hmm. So if I want to be independent, then I need to work to feed myself. I have found it interesting that the international community is coming in to tell us that, well, you can pass this law. Even though you seem to be a sovereign nation, you can pass this law. Mm -hmm. And we have the Ministry of Finance coming to tell us that you will lose over $3.8 billion if you pass this law. So analysts and intellectuals are saying that the president might not be able to pass this law until he leaves office. And I like the topic that you put there, that there's pressure mounted on the president. So let's go to quickly to the nitty gritty so that my colleagues can also say what they want to say. Any time a law is passed, you know, it's going through, this is not a law yet, it's a bill. It's gone through the stages, uh, the committee stages, and it's come to the, both houses have passed it. It's a bipartisan law. It's, okay. it's a bill that has been passed. All that the president will have to do is to assent to it. We have Article 106 of our 1992 Constitution that talks about the time period that the president is supposed to assent to bills. And we also know that individuals have sent this to the Supreme Court, challenging the constitutionality of this. Now, I belong to some organization in the U.S. that I was about to stand for, a mayor in, in Cincinnati, and Center for Progressive Leadership, which is a democratic organization. And this, this very law is the reason why I did not contest for mayor in Cincinnati, Ohio. So I understand very well, we call it Proposition 18. And you know that Obama was the only president who publicly talked about LGBT, and it did not affect his polling in the polls. So when we met in Cleveland for six months, this issue came up. And I remember some guys coming to meet me at Clifton in Ohio asking me that, you see, you need to assent to this. You need to agree to this. And I said that my values are different. So I cannot be part of it. Now, when this whole thing started, this is what happened. They were using kids, children, and the children would say that you cannot use, you know, separate our parents. And I said that, look, if two adults are doing their own thing, you don't bring children in, you know, as a commercial that you can separate them. Now, I, like I said, I'm a very conservative Adventist. I go to parent-teacher conference, and you have a child who has two parents one is a mother, one is a father. The two of them are males. They come and say, this is my mother, this is my father. To me, you are confusing these children. Because two men are coming to parent-teacher conferences and saying that I am the mother, and one is saying that I am the father. So is that our values? I am making a point that everything in leadership should be framed in the terms of your morals, your values. So we have some coalition. And the coalition is saying that, what is the name? The Human Rights Coalition, that's the big mm -hmm. 18. They are saying that uh, you cannot criminalize somebody's identity. No, sexual orientation. Sexual orientation. Now, mm -hmm. sexual orientation, we should educate people. One thing that I've seen with Joy and uh, TV3 is that about 80% of Ghanaians listen to the key stations. And well, 
uh, it, that that may be relatively subjective. Well, B based on the data, I use the word about. The, uh, Remember, yeah, I'm, I'm a professor, so when that, I that, use that, words, that, that may, but that may not be the case. Um, yes, but all right, so I, you, I do you do your research. You do your research, and then come out with the proper numbers, and then we see. So when we have a lot of Ghanaian voters who you know like the key language, then it means that when I come to sit here. Yes, I can talk intellectually, but how do I soften it to the level of every Ghanaian who will understand what I'm speaking? Which is common sense. And that's where wisdom comes in. So wisdom is the practical theory that, you know, the, the theory that we use in, in practical way to understand things. So two right. things we do in academia. We can let the theory inform the practice, or we can also let the practice inform the theory. Right. Things that we practice every day, we can make a theory out of it. Okay. And things that we have theory, we can make it practical. So I am going to end this way. They say that you cannot criminalize a personal, somebody's sexual identity. Mm -hmm. Go, growing up, I went to Kofori at, at Ghana Senior High School. And then I went to Opokuari for six form. And then I was at uh, University of Kipos. We knew guys who behaved like women. Right? We knew guys who talk and walk like women. Sometimes we call them Obaya and some names. But nobody bothered them. From the 1992 Constitution and the laws that we had, nobody bothered these people. We knew they had more estrogens. They had more female tendencies, or some of the men had more, you know, some of the ladies had more male tendencies. But there was nothing about that until pressure began to mount on our leaders about passing this law. Now, if America is okay with it, and remember the way Americans passed this law, it wasn't the Congress, because America started Proposition 18 from California. And Proposition 18 from California meant that the whole state had to vote yes or no for LGBT. And the first time, the state voted no. So when people sit here and say that Americans like LGBT, it is not every American who agrees to LGBTQ. And the reason is that when the Proposition 18 state, because in that constitution, so America have their own constitution, you are supposed to go out of the 50 states, 25 of the states will have to vote. And then when we get half of it, then we'll go on a referendum for people to vote yes or no. Now, the first state voted no. So they went to Congress. And the, first, the House and then the Senate, they all failed. So what Obama did was to go to the Supreme Court. Now, I am building this point for Ghanaians to educate people because education is part of every solution. When it went to the Supreme Court, the framers of American Constitution knew that the weakest wing of all the three arms is the judiciary. Mm. Why? Because you have only nine people. If you're able to convince just five out of the nine, you pass. So Obama went straight to the Supreme Court, and we had five out of the nine passing it. So Americans woke up one day, and you know, gay was um, you know, passed. So you have to make adjustment to it. We're thinking about even at, at the university how to make provision for the urinals and the bathrooms because you can't pick, put male and female and then transgender there. So now I ask my student, what do we do? And then they told me that, Prof, you know what? At the end of the month, you will know whether you were male or a female. Okay. Professor, I'm not going to there. And we're bringing in the <laughs> academics because he's an academician and he's, he's taught extensively in many, many state, uh, states and universities in the U.S. It's very interesting the dynamics that you bring to this, this conversation about what's been going on. But there are other states, in fact, a number of states that they, they are still opposed to the LGBTQ law. So that's another one that we, sh we should also uh, consider. But the fundamental issue here, which the likes of uh, those who are opposed to it, call them the big 18 CSOs, is, is why criminalize someone's sexual orientation? What is the position of the law on this particular issue? And the lack of consultation is one that the likes of Professor H. Chris Pempe raises. Now, why did you not, in, in, the, in the words of Professor H. Chris Pempe, give extensive consideration to consultation during this process of even engagement on this bill in Parliament, knowing the severe implications, in his words, of this bill before even passing it? I would have to be very honest with you that Throughout my life in Parliament, and I'm in my third term now, um, 12 years in Parliament almost, I have never seen 
a piece of legislation that has had this extensive consultation. At the last count, more than a hundred groups, hundred groups, have been consulted, have been engaged, including across CSOs, Shraj. This is one bill that I even saw international organizations come to parliament, UN agencies, AU, ECOWAS, international NGOs, all making inputs, submitting memos. I recall that there was a point where the right honorable speaker even criticized the committee that they were keeping too long with their consultations mm -hmm. and going on and on that really how how far do you want to go with consultations won't it have a certain termination because he remember that interestingly our last two speakers have made this a legacy project mm -hmm. so uh professor aaron michael okwe was very passionate about this and then the current speaker the right honorable Alban Sumana kings for Badbin. I mean, if there's any matter that we've had speakers, you know, agree on and they've been so ad idem and so passionate about it, about making sure that this becomes a legacy, mm -hmm. it is this piece of legislation. And it's received extensive consultation. I'm not aware that Parliament restricted the levels of consultation or prevented anybody from submitting memos or from engaging parliament as an institution. So mm -hmm. we have to clarify that. Now, I want to go back to the background. Many people forget that, but for the pressures from this same international community that is today talking down at our leaders, seeking to intimidate, seeking to threaten, seeking to meddle in domestic affairs, which all of us must frown against because it is not acceptable in international diplomacy. And I know what I'm talking about as a ranking member on the Foreign Affairs Committee, and I'm glad that my chairman is here. Mm -hmm. You don't meddle in the domestic affairs of the host country where you, 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 you have your embassy or your high commission in such you know, a very glaring and offensive manner. As you, you will recall, first, the Australian high commissioner to Ghana. You remember, he went around openly advocating, commissioning offices, advocacy centers for LGBTQ. When it came to her attention, we invited the Honorable Foreign Minister. She said she had no idea. She had not been informed about those events. She didn't know about the commissioning. Nobody knew about it. Outright provocation. I mean, before even this piece of legislation, our laws have been clear on natural canon knowledge. Our value systems, we are clear. I mean... We are a very conservative society. And every country you go to as a diplomat, you must respect their laws, respect their value systems, respect their practices. I, I, I cannot imagine. Look, recently, Morocco refused a Western diplomat's accreditation because mm -hmm. it was revealed when he submitted his credentials the agreement you must provide your profile it emerged that he's married to a man he's the practitioner of this lgbtq they had the right they stopped the person saudi arabia has mm -hmm. done that and there are a number of countries i didn't hear all this hue and cry and all of these threats they quietly withdrew the nomination so we must go back to basics. So first, there was that provocation by the Australian High Commissioner. Who really stirred the honestness? I'm sure that we were willing to let sleeping dogs lie. I mean, 
we've seen all of these symptoms every now and then. And we haven't bothered much really as a country about what people decide to do in their bedrooms. Mm -hmm. But it's, 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 it's that provocation, one. Then number two, you recall that sometime in 2019, we woke up one morning and saw all of this literature from UNESCO about comprehensive sexuality education in our schools. You recall? Mm -hmm. Many Which people, you, you yes, mm -hmm. I spoke op publicly and openly and, 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 and even made submissions on the floor of parliament. That was going on here. We summoned the Ministry of Education, the GES, and they told us that they had not approved that curriculum. curriculum. So how yes. did they get there? That's the question. Mm -hmm. How did they get there? And if you, I recall, if you look at some of the, uh, the, the, the content in that, in that publication, they listed families, types of families. And they were going to teach young kids, the books were already in the schools, in mm -hmm. primary school, that we have same-sex family, that we don't have only two sexes. There are more than 20 sexes, and you can even decide mm -hmm. that uh, you, 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 you are fluid and you are still mm -hmm. assessing who you are and all of that. You are not male, you are not female. You know, very you know, strange content <laughs> took us by surprise. So it is, it is, you see, it is, it is these things that served as trigger. How we were being undermined, our sovereignty, our values, and, and suddenly you wake up and there's all of this advocacy led by the Australian High Commissioner, and then you have this comprehensive sexuality education that found its way in our schools. We, we, we felt we were under siege, under attack. I mean, our sovereignty didn't matter, our laws didn't matter, our values didn't matter. That is what triggered colleagues to put together this private member's bill. So we need to go back to how this occurred. Mm -hmm. Now let me come to the current provocation. Look, to be very honest with you, Alfred, I am totally appalled and disgusted by the attempt to link money I have here the IMF agreement approved mm -hmm. May 17, 2023. Which, which we, it's, we, we, it's we're going to get into. But three three what, billion dollars. Mm? Mm -hmm. And you have our Ministry of Finance also putting out what we could potentially lose, 3.8. Mm -hmm. I ask 3. a question. 3.8 billion. 3.8 billion dollars. I ask a question. How much money is more important than us uh, as a people? Uh, the respect for us. Let us be allowed to fashion out our own value systems, our own traditions. But how far how can much, we push? How much, how, much, how much money? How much money are we willing to take mm, mm -hmm. to sacrifice our values, to sacrifice our identity, to sacrifice who we are? Look, I hate with a passion any attempt by any outsider to use money. Look, if we were managing affairs properly, yes. if, if we had good leadership, yes. look, this country is not poor. We don't need, look at these sums, because of $3 billion. I mean, how much is $3 billion? If you look at some, some projects that, that we have done, you know, a few days ago, mm -hmm. I was, you know, up in arms against uh, the National Cathedral Project we'll and all to. the wastage mm -hmm. with that. You know, if we, we manage our resources properly, look at how many Western countries have the natural resources we have from gold to oil to diamond to bauxite to timber. And you want to come and dictate to us. And how come we don't see this level of dictatorship mm, and, 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 and diplomatic arrogance in other jurisdictions. Well, we, we, don't, we don't see, see that, that. We don't see that. We don't see that in Saudi Arabia. For well, example. but have you not? Have you not you invited know, we, this we don't to don't see you, that onto yourself? If yes. you say, if you say you are comparing yourself with Saudi Arabia, that that is self-sufficient financially. They are not going around cup in hand begging like what you are doing. Exactly. Good. So, Alfred, we are and, we and are on the same page. You are continuously pushing sovereignty. So, Alfred, we are on the same page. We are making the same point. We are on the same page. Look, if it's about human rights lectures, mm -hmm. lectures on human rights. Mm -hmm. The last time I told a few uh, diplomats who uh, raised this matter for discussion, and I told them that, look, the biggest threat to human rights now, as we speak, is not this Ghanaian piece of legislation. It's the genocide going on in Palestine. What are they doing about it? Over 30,000 people have been killed. Look, I can't even watch international news these days. When you see babies, innocent, Ham, 
harmless, unarmed women in hospital. Mm -hmm. People are being bombed, are being slaughtered. Look, I condemn what those terrorists did in Israel on the 7th of October. Mm -hmm. I condemn that. And my position is that identify the terrorists and deal with them. I don't care if they are put in life imprisonment or if they are if 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 they are uh, uh, they, they face the death penalty. Even though uh, ideologically I am opposed to the death penalty, mm -hmm. but I don't care what you do. But identify the perpetrators and deal with them. Don't say that because of that, you are going to virtually wipe out a whole nation, mm -hmm. thousands of people. I mean, over thirty thousand people. Think about it. Have been killed. Have been slaughtered. Why are we not seeing this level of, you know, anger and uh, outrage and, you know, uh, this, 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 this talking down and con condescending tone, you know, at Netanyahu, who is leading this? You know, why are they not stopping this genocide? If really mm, the concern mm -hmm. is human rights. So look, I will submit strongly and forcefully that it is because of abysmal leadership and how we are dependent and they think that this these are some broke ass guys let's you know just go and dictate to them and talk to them anyhow and we can you know virtually threaten them look they should back off unless i don't have issues with local you know ghanaian human rights organizations who are raising concerns let's have a discussion uh let's let's see because i will always want everybody uh, rights to be protected. As a social democrat, mm -hmm. we normally would champion the cause of minorities. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at the ideological spectrum, mm -hmm. you know, those of us who are left of center are more, you know, all embracing. We are more inclusive as compared to our, our good friends on the conservative right. You know, but on this matter, we are all in agreement. Look, the speaker asked in parliament, is there any one MP? Who is opposed to this piece of not one person? Well, there, there not, may be some who will be privately against it, but publicly you would have well, to align. Well, then it that means then it then then that is hypocrisy. Then, then that's hypocrisy. It means you are not even where that seat you yes. are occupying in that house. I mean, speak up against it. Why? Right. There are some colleagues who felt that there were some provision that can be improved. They filed amendments. We went to three, we debated it. But even those colleagues did not, in principle, say they are opposed to it. Everybody knows. You look. Representation is about the people, it's about their values, it's about what their beliefs are. You cannot represent them if you are not like them and you don't represent their interests and their values and their systems. So people know in that house mm -hmm. that if uh, you, you better just give up your seat, you know, if, um, if, 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 if you, you oppose mm -hmm. uh, this, these matters. But honestly, when the president spoke, on this matter, I thought that he really should have maintained a position of, you know, uh, respect for his people, for our laws. He should have asked the diplomatic community to back off. He, he appeared. Well, as he if, says he, Ghana he, is not he, going to renege on our, yeah, that on, he, our on our that, record yeah, of human rights. All of it was all of the that was of assurances to the diplomatic. How about assurances to the people who elected him? How about assurances to us? That to the sovereign people of Ghana. That the he, he appears more concerned about the, the feelings, the idiosyncrasies, the threats of withdrawing uh, aid and loans. In any case, all these documents I'm holding here, I have the annual public debt report. I have the IMF agreement. All of these are loans. We are going to pay back. If we don't pay in our lifetime, our children are going to pay. They are not doing us any favors. Have you looked at the interest rates? You mm -hmm. can go through this document. I see the interest rate. Others are doing transactions. They are doing business. They benefit from it. If you even look at the, condi the conditionalities that come with it, those, the companies that might execute these contracts, eventually the money goes back to them. So if you look at the literature on loans, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> look, it's, it's, it's business. Many academics now agree they are, there's a certain convergence that, look, they benefit far more, that you are better off even avoiding these loans. I'm not aware of any country that has made it uh, tying its apron strings to the Britain Woods. None of the Asian, Asian tigers we celebrate, you know, uh, transformed their societies, became uh, fully developed economies, 
with loans and aids uh, from the Britain Woods. You know, it's about having homegrown solutions. It's about visionary leadership, mm -hmm. avoiding wastage, avoiding corruption, and making sure that you invest smartly and wisely. That's the only way forward. But and, so, and so, look, I have to be honest with you that I didn't think that the president should be succumbing to pressure. And this is not the, this is the what, first what, what, what time. When, when Kamala just... Harris came, when Kamala Harris uh -huh. came, he doubled down and was, you know, appeared to you know, want to uh, assure and placate her. Look, we are a sovereign nation. Look, I miss, I miss uh, how Professor Mills, you recall, mm -hmm. stood up to Prime Minister Kamara at the time and said, hey, if it's about your money, keep it. We are a sovereign country. Mm -hmm. we, 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 we pursue our own values, our own, our own systems. We fashion out our own destiny. You know, Professor Mills did not miss words. And, and that's the kind of leadership. I, I mean, I, I, I want to imagine how the Osajifu Dr. Kwame Nkrumah will have spoken to these, dip, these diplomats, especially in a week that they had all been issuing statements right from Washington and other places, talking down, very condescending, and all of that. Meanwhile, we mm -hmm. see their friends elsewhere. See how close they are with the Saudis. They are business investments there, and how they are always, you know, visiting them and, you know, in bed. <laughs> but with them. you know, that, so, that, so, I, I, so, I, I so, 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 why, why what? different strokes for different folks? Why, why this, this very offensive posture? I, I am totally appalled by it. Well, uh, that's what this, the Saudi reference. I've just stated to you why that may be faulty. But um, you know, this is. I'll show you the list of the, the, the loans that the finance ministry says that could be impacted if this bill is accented to by the president. They've, uh, they, they, they are the only agency, the state organ, to, to come out publicly to caution the president not to sign this bill into law. I'm going to put that on the screen right now, the list of the loans that the finance ministry talks about that could be impacted. In fact, this was a five-page document that they released on Monday explaining that the 2024 budgetary that's 600 million budget support 250 million for the financial stability fund this was a fund established to 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 help financial institutions impacted heavily by the ddp and then also the expected 300 million dollars uh financing from the first ghana resilient recovery development uh policy there is also uh which is currently pending parliamentary approval we also have the ongoing negotiations on the second Ghana Resilient Recovery Development Policy operation amounting to $300 million. That's what you see on the screen there. And then also the ongoing negotiations of $250 million Ghana Financial Stability Fund. This, all this, according to the Finance Ministry, could be impacted if this bill is passed into law. Then the disbursement of the $2.1 billion for ongoing projects Projects worth $900 million could be impacted, and in all, Ghana could lose some $3.8 billion in World Bank financing over five to six years. But yesterday, you approved one of these loans in Parliament, right? This one that is listed. Yeah, our colleagues on the majority side uh, approved it. We, we opposed it. We opposed it. Uh, that was, uh, yeah, the $300 million uh, resilient facility. <clears throat> yeah, we voted against it. Okay, I see. But, 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 but they were more than us, so uh, they, okay. it's, it's you know, been current. Uh, mm -hmm. I just want to respond to this last statement <clears throat> yes, please. made by my colleague. Right. If I, we don't speak like that, we don't come out, uh, having passed a bill in parliament, you come out and say, I'm not part of it. It is oh, a work yes. of parliament. No, the record excuse must, me, excuse must me, reflect excuse that. me. Mm -hmm. In parliament, when any bill is there and we're debating, uh, both sides will speak to it. But at the end of the day, a decision comes from parliament, and it is a parliamentary decision. Simple. So it is not your personal position in the debate. When Parliament would have passed, and indeed yesterday when we were passing that bill, uh, that loan, uh, those who are against, you will see that the voice was very low, and you were all in Parliament. So how come you come out of Parliament and say that we minority didn't participate? We participated to the full. I didn't, let, say, I didn't say we didn't participate. I said we voted against it. You voted against? Yes. Did we vote against? Yes, we voted for and against. Yeah, okay. and those, and those, listen, listen. Yes, those who are for it say yeah. yeah. Yes. And the voice 
was there. Exactly. Those right. who were against, you see, the you minimum was no. there. But okay. we were, in fact, the minor, no. minority were even more than the it's majority yesterday in parliament. And I was there. You can, you can show that. Oh, so, I was there okay. It's not true. Okay. More than so, oh, parliament like, has passed it in. It is not fair. I state okay. on the record that when, the parliamentary when parliament record passes was passes like, hands out Okay, General. Don't come out and say that I did not. We did not. Thank you. It is the work of parliament. Opinions were noted, indeed. Okay, now, so let us because, because, yes, because, look, and let's talk about the issue. Because you are the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee of right. Parliament. Yes. How far can we push this sovereignty argument in this particular issue? That, yes, we're a sovereign nation, we have to uphold our values, but yet again, we still are compromised because we, we go cap in hand begging these institutions that. Some of the coaches to black guys live it about that they are dictating to us. Aren't we the cause of our own problems? Well, one could say that because if we had managed our resources well, probably we have managed our economy well, we wouldn't get to this point. Mm -hmm. But now we are here. So for me, uh, we have to look at possibilities coming out of this situation mm -hmm. we have. Uh, again, I agree with uh, Samir when he says that uh, there was some provocation that culminated into the desire to even. Uh, uh, put together this put bill. together this bill. Uh, because uh, our laws as we have them in Ghana are indeed adequate to be able to check these practices mm -hmm. indeed it is criminal for you to engage in um, uh, unlawful kind of knowledge mm. uh, even as we speak without the passage of the law mm. but uh, and people think that this law is uh, intended to uh, criminalize the act of LGBTQ. No, mm -hmm. that is not a point. Right. There is already an existing law that criminalizes it. But this law proposes this to bill. expand this bill. bill yes. Proposes to expand the effectiveness of the existing law into publication, uh, advocacy, and promotion. And that is what this bill seeks to criminalize. So that um, Something that you are forbidden to do, you are not uh, clandestinely uh, publishing or advocating or promoting uh, on the quiet. So um, the e effect of this law is to uh, criminalize that section of the continuum, mm -hmm. and not uh, to introduce a bill that will uh, uh, criminalize the action. The action is already criminalized. Mm -hmm. So the laws are already adequate. And we have had this law since 1960 uh, until mm -hmm. uh, recently that, uh, in fact, people from the um, foreign affairs community uh, tried to introduce foreign cultures into Ghana. And the people of Ghana, in fact, even without the law, the people of Ghana said no. Mm -hmm. In fact, when we woke up one day to see publication of uh, some weird flags and colors and things yeah. Rainbow, everybody uh, Rainbow colors. yes everybody be, became alarmed they said what is happening and in fact even the men on the streets said no we can't have this and you remember there was an attack on the office even which was not provoked or organized by anybody it was a spontaneous attack on the office which gives indication that the people of ghana says no to that practice and therefore, we should take it from there. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, uh, if we have a law that says don't do it, mm -hmm. and you do it, and you say that I have a right to do advocacy of that which is criminalized, how can you glean a right out of criminality? You cannot. There is no right that will come from criminal action. That thing mm -hmm. is criminalized. You say I have a right to do advocacy, to convince somebody to do it. Inversely, and we have uh, our laws also frowning on uh, even people who are doing um, uh, advocacy, who are planning, who are uh, supporting. You see, and these are all criminalized. If you are, if we have um, laws against stealing, mm -hmm. and you you want to collaborate with somebody to plan to steal, that is also an offensive law. Right. Uh, so a uh, law that against that. Mm -hmm. If you want to also support somebody who is doing that act, that also is also criminalized. So the same way, uh, the criminalization of unlawful canal knowledge gives an, an automatic imp impression that 
if you plan to do it, you are also doing a criminal act. And if you support somebody to do it, you are also doing a criminal act. So by inference, mm -hmm. uh, the laws against uh, unlawful canal marriage extend to cover abetment and uh, promotion and all that mm -hmm. by inference. We only want to bring out this law to, to concretize it so that you will not come to court and say, I did not understand it or I did not know that the law extends to the publication and co promotion and all that. So this law is just giving clarity to an already existing law how its effect ought to be in the country. Trust me, um, Pro Professor Prempe says that there was not enough consultation. That cannot be correct. That is not right. Uh, I want us, particularly people coming from academia, to be honest in their advocacy on matters like this. Because I'm always we, honest. We, I'm yes, yes, honest. but when somebody says this, yeah, yeah, so when somebody says this from academia, says that there was not enough consultation, who else? Did he want to consult and was so, given so opportunity? This, this is the quote attributed to him, and I think that it's going to be very fair that I read it. Mm -hmm. This you're talking to Professor H. Christopher, he says, quote, the more reason the executive should have taken exceptional interest in it from the beginning and made serious engagement, serious engagement with all the stakeholders, the key stakeholders, knowing its severe implications for the economy and the country's various international interests and obligations. You don't just sit and watch a bill like this go through parliamentary processes for over two years without having any serious engagement with its sponsors and buckets. Who does that? Okay. Now, with this explanation, I understand uh, where he was coming from. He is trying to say that, in fact, the executive didn't engage even uh, parliament enough. Mm -hmm. I agree with him then. Uh, if it was about engagement with parliament. Of powers. No, no, no. Yeah. No, but, parliament but, but, laws. Yeah. Listen, but yeah. it was also going to be, uh, going to be better if an uh, executive had come in to also state positions. So his so word we, is right, engagement. engagement. But, but not to come and convey no, 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 anything. No, no, no. But even yes. we allow the public to engage us. Yes. So uh, when he but, says but the executive, there was, there was some engagement. Mm -hmm. I remember the attorney general. Attorney general, the attorney general came. came. Okay. Uh, but yes. probably yeah. he was yeah. talking about the, the whole maybe, executive maybe, maybe, maybe taking a position. Maybe deepening it. Uh, but, uh, deepening but, it but, or even yeah. engaging us at different levels. But probably that was minimal. It was done, but minimal. But uh, then if he's talking about what uh, the executive knew and wanted to do but didn't do, then fine, I will agree with him. Mm -hmm. But there was co uh, extensive, extensive consultation. Extensive. Uh, and particularly, I know that I, on many occasions, I even had to engage the, the clergy. Uh, uh, Catholic Bishops Conference, I was there with Moses Fomweni. They also came to Parliament. They met with us. So many people. And we met also at... Uh, um, Christian Council. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of consultation. Okay. We had a lot of uh, people coming to Parliament to also state positions. But I agree that maybe the executive didn't take particular interest uh, through the process uh, to state the positions they are stating now. If they had probably stated those positions during the course of the bill, maybe we would, may have changed. But the principle of uh, ensuring the criminalization of advocacy and promotion of LGBTQ will remain uh, untouched. But we may have, right. maybe on the sanctioning system, maybe uh, looking at uh, the length of uh, incarceration and all that. And indeed, we even affected it because it started from 10 years. Yeah. Then we ended up at five years. Mm -hmm. So at least uh, that one, the amendments were carried. Yeah. Uh, but Council, just give me a, a minute. And I'll, uh, you still have your time. You still have okay. your time. You still please note uh, that. Uh, just a quick intervention. Uh, professor Godfrey Bopping um, is a professor of finance at the University of Ghana Business School. And I'll come to you. Please hold on your thoughts on this. Professor Godfrey Bopping, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, good morning. Uh, good morning to your panelists and uh, 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 viewers. Thank you for having me on the show. Yes, I, I understand that you, you, you have a situation, so you, you would have to leave us in a bit. But a, a quick point on this. The, the financial implications concerns that the finance ministry raises in this five-page document they released uh, during the week, does it have any basis of concern for us as a country that indeed if this bill should be accented to by the president we stand the risk of losing 
close to 3.8 billion CDs in, in loans but from, the international, uh, from the Bretton Woods institutions, particularly the World Bank? Well, thank you very much. Um, certainly, um, one could not be ignorant of the fact that uh, there could be implications. Um, um, even if not from the international community, I mean, um, the fact that some people do not uh, agree to such a um, 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 bill, uh, and if it becomes a law, Certainly, um, one should not be uh, ignorant of the fact that there could be implications. But all it is, for uh, any sovereign nation that takes steps to to assert itself based on also its cultural beliefs, values, and all of that, you can't take that away from how uh, 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 laws are made or policies are made, either from the financial perspective. Uh, from um, uh, economic policy formulation or so. But um, if you examine the statement from the Ministry of Finance, you could see that uh, it wasn't professional. And it was too narrow, narrow-minded. And I believe that if they had done their research and analysis very well, they would have, they would have advised the president based on available evidence at a global uh, and then continental level in terms of the dynamics rather than perhaps taking this narrow view uh, essentially and, and probably from a, a professional body an institution like the ministry of finance uh, you, you, would, you would be more considered you would have been more considered as to the the, the, the dynamics so that you are able to advise the president in a more balanced view, position, so that you take all available evidence into consideration. Um, my considered view, and I think someone has said that on your uh, uh, on your station this morning, that when it comes to criminalization of homosexuality, we didn't start today. I think that is the, that is the, the whole the theme of this whole discussion. Uh, and, and there are quite a number of countries, I mean, some would be uh, uh, pro-Islamic or, or would Islam dominating in terms of the percentage of population, some also pro-Christian and, and all of that. I have taken similar positions long ago I mean, the issue of homosexuality, its criminalization has been there long ago. And, and, and even where they have elevated it in terms of the ramifications and emerging issues, the evidence on the ground does not conclusively, conclusively support the position of the Ministry of Finance. And that is why one would be wondering why the Ministry of Finance would, would seek to put that fear in the president and, 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 and put fear in Ghanaians. Um, if you recall, in 2018, Ghana had already started discussions about developing our country to the point of being beyond needing aid. We have discussed Ghana beyond aid. We had the Ghana beyond aid chapter. Uh, effort, even without going into the substance of this, there is something as a country we ought to know that aid, whether we sign this bill or not, aid sustainably is not going to be there. Aid has been declining. It doesn't matter that Ghana is a donor darling country. Aid is no more there, even on a sustainable Basis. If you look at the data since 2007, particularly when Ghana became a middle income country, of course, at the lower end, with the new basin of our, our, of our economy, I see. our access to aid from our traditional partners have been declining considerably. If you also look at the focus of our development partners these days, 
the IMF, the World Bank, the European Union, and the rest of them. You can also see a gradual shift of that in terms of their support to the country towards the areas of technical assistance and capacity building that is geared towards making Ghana self uh, to be sustainable. Well, is, is that not because mm -hmm. we, we, we as a country declare that we are beyond uh, this Ghana Beyond Aid you know, initiative? That's what influenced this re redefinition of the aid towards the country. And I, I monitored that at least for the past four or five years, isn't it? Yes, yes. But no, no, it's not just Ghana Beyond Aid. I mean, the aid decline, aid volatility has been there practically from 2010, 2011. You, you can check the data. We saw it going up slightly with respect to COVID, uh, the COVID period, because there were some interventions from the World Bank and then the European Union. But if you look at the financing mix, the aid is, is, is very, very small. So the matter is that, of course, we should not package ourselves in such a way that we are anti-aid or aid rejection. That is also consistent with the Ghana Beyond Aid chapter. But the point, the reality is that the best certain hand that we can find is at the end of our own arm. Now let's come to the main issue. If you look at, there are over 50 member countries of the IMF and the World Bank that have criminalized homosexuality. Over mm -hmm. 50 of them. For, for decades, for decades, the evidence on the ground is that the IMF and the World Bank have not stopped doing business with them. But one would think that the, the West, the IMF and the World Bank, our development partners, would not resort to cutting aid and isolating them as the first resort. That would be, it would be unwise on the part of the IMF and the World Bank to resort to cutting the isolating the country as their first resort. Perhaps the best available option to them would be how do they put major pressure on the country or the president so that such a deal is not signed into a world. Okay. And if you look at other countries, if other countries that continue to right. receive aid, program engagement with the IMF, even have harsher punishment for offenders than, than Ghana. And, and I think somebody also mentioned it on your program that when it comes to criminalization of homosexuality, it didn't start three years ago or four years ago with this bill. Mm -hmm. It's been there. Whether we find a bill or not, there are, we have sufficient grounds, or we have grounds as a country to, 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 to assert ourselves on things that are inconsistent with our beliefs and our culture and our values. We have that. And, and with all of that, the IMF and the World Bank have continued to do business with Ghana. Ghana has been to the IMF 17 times. Okay? Uh, other countries, you can talk about Egypt, you can talk about, uh, even when you talk about Kenya, okay, the, the, the law that criminalizes uh, homosexuality has been with them for a very long time. You can talk about, look, Qatar has laws against LGBTQ. The world went there for, 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 for the World Cup. The world has not boycotted the oil from the Arab countries simply because they have taken position based on their religion and their values and their culture. And then that also defines differences. Once one, how one society is different from the other, how one country is different from the other and the rest of it. If you take the U.S., so right. that is not every state in the U.S., that is promoting LGBTQ and the rest of them. Right. Okay. That has mm. not solved the, uh, the U.S. to say you are no longer a, 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 a state of, uh, within the, uh, the union or whatever. So, so those are the issues. I believe that the world will only become better if we recognize differences rather than exporting cultural imperialism where, where a, a, a few or a group of people think that the way they see the world is the way it must be seen by everybody else. Mm -hmm. No. Right. Uh, uh, and let me also say this. Alfred. Yes. Hello. Yes, Prof. If you, take, if you look at the dynamics at the global level, 
it, it, it would not be in the best interest of even the IMF and the World Bank and the others to resort to cutting aid to Ghana or isolating Ghana as a result of signing this bill. It is also because of the global geopolitics and economic fragmentation mm-hmm. and the rest of the world. Right. So the idea of civilization, nationalism, regionalism, and all that are rising and all of that, if one would sit down and be objective and look at the dynamics, you realize that cooperation and respect for values and the rest of them and differences that come about is more in the best interest of the world than the, uh, the, the approach that perhaps others will wish the fund and the, and the, and the World Bank would take. Okay. Bear in mind that with the Russia-Ukraine conflict and all of that, the IMF and the World Bank themselves have invested considerable research and effort towards building cooperation okay, and respect rather than isolation because that thing overall is not in the best interest of the world in the rest of them. So I think that it 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 is too much of um, of 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 trying to create fear and panic uh, to, to to give such a narrow advice uh, to the president who wasn't properly uh, uh, read. And I, I think that the Ministry of Finance could have done better as an institution. So when you do things like this, you lose your respect. And, and, I, and, and I personally, I was disappointed in, in the Ministry of Finance, the approach that they adopted, whether we like it or not. But bear in mind right. that, that the, the, at, independence, mm. at independence, there were considerable fears of what Ghana would lose if we were to go ahead with our independence. There right. was a discussion of whether we should go for the independence now or over a certain period of right. time. Our forefathers took the decision, paid the price, and we must also do our part to leave a country behind that the next generation will be happy that we came first. Okay. Professor Godfrey Bokwin, I appreciate your time and your intervention on this matter. Thank you. Thank you very much, as always. God bless you. God, God bless you. Bless you too. I uh, see Professor Finance at the University of Ghana Business School. So quite clear in his words that uh, the Ministry of Finance in this statement is um, spreading fear with this statement, the five-page statement of how much we could lose if this becomes law, 3.8 billion, and uh, it could have done better. And, and, and quite disappointed in that regard. But if you look at, in fact, I've just got a, a notice, and Council, yes. I'll bring you in at this point, because yes. just on the 6th of March, when we were celebrating our independence, mm-hmm. the IMF concluded the fifth review of Uganda's extended credit facility. Uganda. Uganda. And mm-hmm. this completion enables the immediate disbursement of about $120 million to Uganda. Mm-hmm. See? So, there's Uganda, Kenya and there's, 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 yes. If you look at the, the special drawing rights list, yeah, the I'm fact okay. sheet on All the right. IMF website, you see it. Uganda has its uh, laws prescribing punishment by death. Yes. Mm-hmm. For persons engaged Much in, than we have in Ghana. persons engaged in LGBTQ, yeah. the, what we have in our laws is what maximum of what three five years? years, five, five years. 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 Yes. So, was there any real legitimacy Listen, uh, in this in these issues that the finance ministry is working? Listen, Abed, even looking at the relationship between Ghana and IMF, was there any contemplation of an introduction of a clause in respect of uh, LGBTQ? And the answer is no. So. Uh, is that relationship is contractual. Mm-hmm. So we have terms of the arrangement uh, within the IMF program. And it did not include uh, our, um, uh, uh, our passage of this bill. Because at the time they were negotiating, it was not an issue that was raised there. So if IMF says that because we have passed this bill, we are not going to respect the contract that is already in motion, they have already disbursed part of the amount. So what will happen to that amount that is disbursed? Is it a case that they abrogate the contract at their expense in respect of the payment? Do we have any rights under the agreement we had with them? And these are all contractual relations. So therefore, uh, we cannot purport to import new provisions into an arrangement that is already delivered in, in, in motion. Mm-hmm. So that fear, of losing grounds in respect of the IMF program 
it's not there, it's unfounded, and I'm not sure that uh, with, even within law, you can say that I had a contract with you on this, uh, now I want to import. In fact, mm -hmm. the importation of any as a junior's uh, provision ought to be agreed by the two parties. I see. And I'm not sure that Ghana has agreed with IMF that we will now uh, bring in uh, conditions of LGBTQ enactment as part of the provisions of that uh, agreement. It is mm -hmm. not there. So that which is not there cannot be de cannot be imported into without the consent of the, the, the contracting parties. So for me, uh, that is only a threat that is very hollow and empty. Mm -hmm. So we shouldn't, you know, even address our mind to it at all. Uh, again, if you look at the U.S. laws, there is a law we call Edmonds anti uh, polygamy law of 1892. Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. If you go into that law, it criminalizes polygamy. And in recent years, there has been an amendment that has brought uh, defined polygamy to include cohabitation without marriage. Mm -hmm. Which means that if uh, you are found to be sleeping or to be living with two women in the United States, mm -hmm. then you come under that law, mm -hmm. and then you 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 be brought before court. And if you are found guilty, and look at the sanctions, mm -hmm. five hundred pound uh, dollars upfront plus uh, uh, imprisonment between three and five years. They are not saying five hundred. Oh, the law is not all. It's mm -hmm. and yes. <coughs> so if. You engage in polygamy, and in recent times, per the uh, amendment, if you uh, seem to be cohabitating with two women, then you come under. And the law says that even the women are also uh, to suffer criminal sanctions. If the, the two women, or two or three women, were uh, uh, in cohabitation with one man, they will also suffer the same sanctions. And this is United States law. And this is not um, state law, it is federal law which covers the whole of the United States. So, and uh, you remember the story of the Mammons. Mm -hmm. They said that they wanted to engage in polygamy. Yes. And, Utah. and indeed, the Utah. Utah. Yes, the state of Utah. Mm -hmm. And indeed, the property of the church were all confiscated to the state yeah. because they wanted to engage in polygamy. So how would you turn around and come here where we think that uh, our laws allow for polygamous marriages? Then you will come here and say that we should also uh, include your, 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 your value systems in ours, where you will refuse ours in return. And uh, can there be uh, some, uh, relationship okay. of, of equals? Can, no, can, it cannot does be. Does the president have and, the luxury of time to say that, okay, I'm going to await the Supreme Court outcome of this suit against this bill before a determination of this or, or a decision by me See, is taking as president. A matter before the Supreme Court uh, may not necessarily be determined within months. Mm -hmm. It can even go be within years. And don't forget, I have a matter before Supreme Court that is two years old. I see. And it has not been determined. <laughs> so if we go that, that tangent, it means that uh, we may have to wait for two for, years or so. For, for. But again, the, the critical thing is that if this bill is not assented to before December this year, yes. Uh, we will have to start all over again. That's again. the problem. Because yeah. the president should have assented to the Indian so, so so the 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 Parliament pass it. Look, yeah. the, the, the that is what should have been done. We will not survive yeah. this uh, parliament. The 8th parliament. Yeah. I see. Uh, the 8th parliament. So yeah. when we come yeah. to the ninth parliament unsigned, unassented to, it means we have, to start, have to start we have yeah. all over again. Yeah. Because, because it, it becomes... It dies with the life of this All this going life. on is delayed yeah. tactics. Uh, I see. Yeah. Uh, so um, <laughs> and, and, uh, it is important for us... It's, it's interesting <laughs> to add that when we went to the Supreme Court on the E-Levy, <laughs> it didn't stay the hand of the president. No, no, no. The E-Levy is implemented. Just appearing before a court Honorable doesn't Harun stay... Honorable Ayariga and I. No, no. We went to the uh, Supreme Court on the e No. It shouldn't be implemented. No. Uh, 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 Sam, it, it didn't stay the, 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 the situation is that when you file a written right. court against okay. a, a party mm -hmm. the, and you don't prosecute uh, an injunctive mm -hmm. for injunctive mm -hmm. orders, yeah. mm -hmm. it does not hold the hand mm -hmm. of the other party from doing whatever he is doing, uh, except that if it has... Uh, the, doing the thing has mm -hmm. consequential effect on the 
he leaves. Mm -hmm. Then one may say, but you are going to the Supreme Court for interpretation mm -hmm. of a law. The law is already in existence, yes. so that cannot injunct yes. anybody. So exactly. the president should go ahead until, and to until it. there is. But again, if the president assents to it, the Supreme Court says that it is unlawful to have done that. Uh, it's a matter of just uh, putting away that law mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. coming back to status quo. Interesting. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure there is anything that yes, should stay the president's yeah. yes, consent. Yeah. So uh, let, let's move on. And, no, but and let's, 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 let's also not forget that the president can raise issues with some of the provisions mm -hmm. and return same to yeah, parliament, parliament for further consideration. Okay. No, no. So uh, within seven days, and president says that it is not on his desk. What mm -hmm. I so why is it? What I understand that to be saying to, is that. Uh, the bill is still in Parliament. Mm -hmm. And you see, it takes a process for them to uh, some, send it to the executive. When he says it is not on his desk, then he is not under any obligation to do anything. But when it gets to his desk, then yeah. within seven days, he must make a pronouncement yes. as to whether he's, or not. He's already told us what he'll do when no, no, it no. arrives. No, no, no. <laughs> it has not arrived. We'll, we'll so we'll let it arrive, and then we'll see how the Constitution also plays out in this. The Constitution this gives him seven, seven days or go to uh, Council of State for uh, some advice and then come back to us for amendment. All these are possible. It's but at the end of the day, when we will have amended and uh, pursuant to the advice of the Council of State and all that, it will still come back to the desk. And oh, that at that point, and again, uh, 108, Article 108, mm -hmm. the funny thing there is that the determination as to whether or not the bill has consequential effect on the national press yeah. is to be done by the speaker, not, uh, the, the, not the president. Not the president yeah. So it's at the but, instance of the person uh, presiding. The person presiding. So okay. for now, uh, the fact that the, the person presiding has allowed the bill to go through the various stages up till now, there is a presumption of his determination that it does not affect the, the budget of the country. Great. And therefore, we have long passed the... It's a very important intervention that both of you made. And you, you and the other one... And uh, again, me and, they, me they, and Sami, we are on the Foreign Affairs Committee. committee. Yeah. I'm chairman, he's ranking. Yeah. So we represent the face of the Foreign, Foreign Affairs, Affairs Committee of Parliament. Indeed. Yeah. And indeed, we are and, and, in, unanimous in our position that... On uh, this matter. On this matter. And that's one of the reasons why we brought you here this morning. Oh, okay. So that we can... Okay, we can so I've done justice to you. <laughs> your, yes, <laughs> you can know your Good position job. on this. Uh, so, so it's good that you bring yeah. in that point that if this bill is not passed into law, by end of the life of this parliament, mm -hmm. the whole process will have to start again. All over again. Yeah. All if the new again. parliament comes into force, yeah, so the, the delay obviously is, is it's not making any, yes, any, yes. any any good at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sam George, who is one of the sponsors of this bill, sends me a message. Uh, good morning. The executive engagement with parliament on the bill was done. The Attorney General is a legal advisor of the executive and took part in the deliberations. There was always a representative from the Attorney General's department at all meetings of the committee for the 2.5, I beg your pardon, for the two and a half years the bill spent with the committee. So that's uh, the member of parliament oh, for the Lingo Pram what, constituency. What Professor Prempes appears to be saying is that we did not discuss the financial effect of the bill with the executive. Uh, with the executive. Okay. Uh, Attorney General is looking at the shape of the law, the text of the law, the content, and all that. So Attorney General was always there. No, no well, but well, let me. Except that I would, I would need to emphasize that uh, uh, Professor H. Prempe's views, and, and, and I respect him uh, uh, enormously, mm -hmm. uh, that the executive should have uh, brought to our attention the uh, financial and economic implications. Uh, my view there again is that we should not subsume the importance, the relevance of this bill and this matter to pecuniary interests, mm -hmm. to some, you know, financial discussion. Yeah. And I, I, I think it is wrong. And it interestingly, it's not foreclosed. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. if the president wants to raise that yeah. in the bill, he can yeah. do yeah. that. And and but we can do that. Let me shake out. Let me have some of this money. But values of money is priceless. No money can buy. But let him raise it, and then we will tell him. We are the same people who embrace the president's philosophy of Ghana beyond aid. What has happened to that? 
We are no longer interested in Ghana beyond aid. <laughs> Haven't we said that, look, after 17 IMF programs, after all of this, you know, uh, being swallowed in debt, we are, we, we are in debt distress. Look at the pain we have had to go through as a people because of pain. All this, because of debt, all this uh, domestic debt exchange program, financial haircuts, it's all because of being dependent on loans. So I don't want a to entertain you know how much somebody wants to give us and now what 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 is the national chiefs imams one of you of what's been happening so far parliament has done his work now the finance ministry raises concerns about financial implications which the speakers have muted that it doesn't have any basis. And then the president says, well, let's wait for the outcome of this suit that the Supreme Court assures the diplomatic community we are not going to digress from our human rights record. What's, what's the National Chief Imam Sheikh Dr. Osman Nuhu Shaributu's view on or everything that's been happening? <clears throat> Thank you so much. Uh... Well, having, having listened, I mean, quietly, I, I mean, the various uh, views being business, business expressed, I think my worry, fear, and anxiety, and that of the entire Muslim community has been raised to a crescendo. I mean, uh, especially the aspect that has to do with if we fail to take advantage of this time and the present to assent to this bill in, into law, we are most likely to lose it with the, with the expiration of the lifespan of the current parliament. For me, it's a, it's a, it's a serious worry. It's a, serious, it's a serious worry. Hmm. Now, with respect to the chief imam's position, um, one that I'm, I'm close to and I, I talk to, and he has expressed his views, especially on two occasions that he has met with uh, the former uh, Speaker of Parliament, the Right Honorable uh, Mike Quay, and then the current one, uh, who also visited him at the residence. Um, chief imam's view is that, look, he's, he's 104 years. He's going, he's going to, this year, he'll be celebrating 105 years. Uh, what, is, what it means that he's not growing any younger and, and most likely he will leave us. His misconcern is what kind of Ghana does he leave and what, what kind of value does he leave behind for the inheritance of generation behind him. That's a very deep burden in, on his heart. Very, very deep one. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that for any elderly person of wisdom you know, who has belief in God and also um, his activities are guided by time added values and so on and so forth. We'll also want to think about what kind of legacy you leave behind for future, future generations. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very terrible times we are, we are in. I don't think this subject was having an each subject that we should be even discussing in, 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 in public. But mm -hmm. one other worry <clears throat> for me is the, the fact that there is a sense of an external pressure, financial pressure, you know, as if with a stick on us, watching us, that if you don't do A, we're going to hit you. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, what it, it, it says is that we are not truly really independent. And I, I'm worried that we, I mean, I, I'm of the same age with Ghana, I'm since, since seven years. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And for my life as a child, I have participated in independent celebration until I also became a teacher where I also organized independence and, and, and took I mean, children to, to, to match. And I, I matched with children behind them as also as, as, a, as a member of staff. I have, done, I have done this in my life. But of what meaning is our yearly celebration, replace celebration of independence? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Of what meaning it is that our nationhood can be so be subjected to this kind of pressure to the point that in fact we are losing our freedom we are in total bondage economic bondage yeah. seriously so bondage. a couple of days a couple, a couple of days we were celebrating our independence mm -hmm. independence last of what yeah. last mm -hmm. yeah. independence of what are we still celebrating secondly our nation, you see, uh, yes, some people are saying we are, we are not a theocracy or we are yes, a secular country. A secular I think there's a certain kind of misrepresentation of this thing. Being non 
theocratic nation or being a secular is not synonymous to godlessness. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can, we can, philosophically speaking, it can be debated. What the secularism, what, what does it mean? Mm -hmm. uh, to be secularist and to, be, to, to also talk of secularism as, uh, as a guiding principle in a democracy, I mean, for example, it does not, yes. does not mean God, God. believe there's, there's, yes. there's, yeah, there's does not mean God, godlessness. Yes. Yeah. Well, so, so this thing, I think that is, is, is an insult and affront to our, our dignity as a, as a nation. I have a reference to make on this, the African Charter on Human and, Pe and People's Rights. Mm -hmm. That here, I'm also talking about our Africanness. Yeah. Kwame Nkrumah says that, the, one, of, one of the things that he says about our independence is that today we can see that the African is also capable of managing his own affairs. Yes. So that is the African pride. But is, now now we have been told uh, the family, uh, you see, the, 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 that clause says, the family shall be the natural unit. And I want to emphasize the, the, the fact of the natural. Mm -hmm. The natural unit and basis of society. The state shall, uh, uh, it shall be protected by the state, which shall take care of its physical health and morals. This is about our, about our, our Africanness. And I think um, that um, it's a serious matter for us mm -hmm. because LGBT, in my understanding, and that of the Muslim community, is a threat to the survival of the, of the family. And the family Absolutely. is built on the basis of marriage between a man and a woman. There's no way. You see, and we must also understand that rights and liberties are not absolute. Mm -hmm. So, for example, somebody is saying about, about rights. If, if a young person is in a country is taking cocaine, for example, it's not his right. It's not his own mind that is being spoiled. He's the person who knows that if I take his own this, body. his own body, it's, it's his own body. Why is the state interested in that? Yeah. If he stays in his own room and he takes cocaine and he's destroying, so if every year, like I said somewhere, every year, hundreds of our young people take cocaine and we are losing our young people every year, do you know what that implies to our, the future of our country? That is why in this matter of LGBT also, a threat to a family, what is the future of, of, of our community? community our family well, but this law doesn't even extend to what happens in somebody's bedroom. So that is a, but that's what somebody is saying. Is, is somebody is saying that is this thing is, if two adults are doing this in their rooms, what, what, we are not watchmen. We are, we are not watchmen. We, we don't care about that, but we care about the result, yes. what it means, what it implies to our, our country and, and, and its future. You say it. This law doesn't address that, but the law existing addresses unlawful canon language wherever. Yes, yeah. including the room. Including the room. Yes. Yeah. Once okay. it is found, it is, I mean, you see, and then it's also well, to push. That, that law is also limited. You know? It's limited. It's limited. limited. It doesn't it's cover. It doesn't cover. Yeah, and it's in and really yes, yes. Uh, so this particular yeah. one, this one is more seeks to criminalize yeah. promotion, all, all and, yeah. and uh, the like. You see, yeah, so so this what this law seeks to do, in my view. Is to, the, to give the fullest expression of our borrowings. Is to, ex, to, to really establish as a nation the fullest, our fullest abhorrence to this kind of. That's why 275 members of our parliament and the consultations, I yeah. have read a little bit about, about yes. the process. Yeah. There are three print, two print processes that, that, that informed really the formulation of this. this there was a broad consultation, yeah. isn't it? Yes. And that broad consultation cut across so many other organizations who were, were consulted. Yes. A, a, a steady travel yes. to other nations who, who are pro and against. Media yeah. engagement. Yes. Yes. Media engagements. Yeah. All this. And then our own constitution yeah. was also considered. Yeah. Yeah. So what kind of new wisdom do we need yeah. uh, that uh, people are arguing you know, ag ag against, against this? So, so for the chief imam, he's, he's completely, completely you know, scandalized. Uh, worried, uh, so anxious, an old man, I mean, the kind of country that he dies to leave behind, yeah. our young people, what has happened to the life of our families, and so on and so forth. So the strongest recommendation to the president is that all the due respect, great respect for the president, is mm -hmm. an elderly man, and anyone who wants to speak about him must consider that he's an elderly man, that he must not lose this opportunity. He has only this opportunity this year, yeah. and he has nothing to lose. So the that, president has nothing to lose? He has true. nothing to lose. Martin Amidu, the former uh, special prosecutor, says that the president would not commit this political suicide of accenting... No, he himself must use his conscience yeah. that he has nothing to lose. Well, that's his opinion. <clears throat> He's going to leave office 
and we want the future generation to remember him for the best of things that he has done for them. Leave a legacy that if he has never done anything for us in this country, future generation of young people, remember that we had, once we had a certain politician who had the commitment to protect the, val the values of our, our traditions and culture and beliefs of our country. Because our country is rooted in belief in God. That's why our constitution begins with, in the name of the Almighty God. Our national anthem begins, uh, God bless our homeland Ghana. We swear people into office on the basis of our belief in God and so, so help me God. We recite our national pledge. And so our country is deep, deeply in, in the belief of God. So let us not deviate. And that is the position of uh, the chief imam as I can fully, fully, fully express. Sheikh, I wanted to, 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 to speak to, to the, the president on, on this, especially because of the concern that has been raised at least based on the statement he made to the diplomatic community, the indication is that we are waiting the outcome of whatever happens at the Supreme Court and that we have a human rights record that we are not going to depart from as well. Now, at least based on what we, we understand today, if this delay continues, the, the, all the work over the last two and a half years, almost three years, would go to waste because then if the, the life of this parliament ends in the next uh, 10 months because the life of this parliament will end on the dawn of January 6th, right? Mm. Into January 7th. The bill's life also ends with yeah. this parliament. But Abed, and let it, me just warn you, the human mm -hmm. rights record that we have to defend mm -hmm. does not include uh, uh, LGBTQ right because <laughs> LGBTQ is already criminalized. Yes, in and therefore the rights of Ghana does not include that one. Well, okay. so that's not we, how your president. If, if we are defending, <laughs> if we are defending rights, we are defending rights like rights to education, rights yes. to agriculture. These are yes, a bundle yes, of yes, rights. Yes, yes. It does Which are inalienable. That one. Yeah. It does not I mean, include that one. Yeah. So my understanding is that those rights enshrined and granted by the constitution are uh, that which we are not going to compromise on. Okay. Uh -huh. I see. And that does not include... It does not include... So they don't have the right to the yeah, first place. That, that right doesn't exist. So let's make it clear. This please, thing please. is a bias of a certain un unique nature. <laughs> and and it must be understood. I mean, mm -hmm. that is why we must not treat it as a certain it normal... It's right. It's something yeah. normal. To it's that is like you, yeah. you eat in Ampesit today. And so you okay. say, uh, it's not a normal thing that mm -hmm. you have a choice. Oh, oh, oh today you are, you, are, you are eating two and tomorrow I can eat two. Okay. No, 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 no. What's the position of Islam on, on, on this? I mean, because uh, this obvious. matter has... Islam from Saudi Arabia. I mean, yeah. we share... <laughs> look, Very we close. share these common values with the Christ, Christian community, and yeah. we share this same history. Yeah. Okay. I mean, the Quran speaks about the story of the Sodom and Gomorrah. What is, yeah. more, what is more abhorrent in the sight of God than for him to visit his wrath on the whole community and turn them upside down? Yeah. And you do it in Parliament yeah. on the day yeah. I did the advocacy yeah. and said that yeah. all of us yes. are in support of a bill. Yes. Mm -hmm. Then the yeah. speaker asked the question, whoever does not believe or agree with and rise up and let's yeah. acknowledge you. Yeah. So no, majority, majority and minority. Not a single person. <laughs> so this was by consensus, so in, not one. So the I mean, in South Arabia, for example, which is an Islamic country, it's, it's, it's by death. Yeah. Okay. It's, 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 it's by death. It's okay. supposed to protect the family. The mm. Sharia is underpinned by five very germane, germane principles. One of them is the protection of the family. So every law in Islam, for example, is intended. Once it has to, to come to attack the, the family, the law will have to restrain anyone who is taking that particular uh, action. So, so for us, for Islam, it's a total no-go area. Mm -hmm. Total no-go no -go area. Right. But, but did you have a quorum when you passed this bill? into yes. law. Yes. Sorry, I beg your pardon. When you passed this bill in Parliament, mm -hmm. did Parliament have a quorum? Of course. Yes, we did. There was no issue of quorum raised. And when there is no issue raised, you don't even discuss it. Yeah, I see. And because indeed, the Supreme Court said it in Gwachia and Trendina, mm -hmm. uh, you cannot make pronouncement of matters that are not before the court. So nobody had raised any issue of quorum. So I quorum see. is not part of the arrangement. 
because I'm wondering where this it, it was not I'm asking from. this. Is this, this is coming from <laughs> one of the reliefs that uh, Richard Sky is is seeking from the. Did Supreme we Court. consider coming when in when, when uh, <laughs> in this case that he's taking <laughs> to the Supreme <laughs> Court <laughs> on this matter? <laughs> so yes, the, uh, he's specifically Robert's indicated. Rules of meeting, right? Yeah, that's why I'm asking. <laughs> that's why I'm asking. He says we're going to put it on the screen right now. That no no no. A declaration that upon the true and proper interpretation of Article 33.5 <coughs> of the Constitution, in light of Article 12.1, um, so this is the first one. Let's go to the fourth one, the fourth relief that he's seeking. In fact, this one says, a declaration upon the true and proper interpretation of Article 102 and 104, that Parliament lacked the requisite quorum to pass me? the Human Sexual Rights and Family Values Bill. An yeah. order restraining the Speaker of Parliament and the clerk to Parliament from even presenting this bill to the President. Because the is President he, says this is not, is he, it's not on his deck. for him to want to seek an order of a court to restrain Parliament from yes. his dog. He said it's unlawful. He has nobody goes to court for what, any what reason. Mean? Why? Parliament no, is Parliament. No, nobody we do, raised court. We, yes. You cannot restrain Parliament from doing its job. <laughs> and it's, 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 you know, Parliment has done its job. Yeah. It's for President yeah, so also to respond I mean, to the invitation. I mean, there is a sky. But you cannot. Will, you you cannot. The, the no court will give you an so order to restrain Parliament from legislating. Putting the challenge and see So, well, it's before the court, so let's see. But again, for me, Parliament has its function under the Constitution. So if you want to go to court, to restrain Parliament from doing the functions as <laughs> mandated by the Constitution, then you want to be seen to be unconstitutional. Yes. And you want the court to help you to become unconstitutional. Well, the matters are before you. I don't know, so this is it. You had quorum. You had you you were on the floor that day. Yes, and uh, I'm, I'm I'm hearing this um, question. The release. On quorum for the first time. I, it's, it's part of the relief. Uh, I mean, it's, 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 it's clear to me that there seems to be some <clears throat> shopping going on. He's a lot young on, lawyer, on right? Wide and, scale. And just, just, to, new, just, to, new. just to, you know, place impediments. Yes. Know, I, mean, I, I'm sure. I look. I, 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 I think that this bill has gone through all the stages. It has met all the legal requirements. It has been been passed. Uh, we have probably the most experienced legislator in our uh, country's history to become speaker. Um, he was presiding that day. He put the question. Nobody got up on the motion. Look at our standing orders. Any member can raise the issue of quorum when you've, you, you, you've, you, you discover that we don't meet uh, the numbers. The speaker too can Raise it, it and, is, and it didn't come up. There are rules that it ought yes. to be raised. Yes, it, to yes. generate a debate. Exactly, exactly. Uh, for which the bell will be rung for ten minutes. Mm. After which, if uh, uh, within an hour members do not come to form the quorum, then the meeting is is, is adjourned for that day. <coughs> All hold of it. this was not done. Our rules, hold are, it. our rules are very clear. Sammy, hold it. Yeah. Don't forget that. In fact, uh, uh, members in committees yeah. are deemed to be members present. Okay. Yes. So yes. when you find uh, the membership of uh, parliament uh, probably thinking that it's not up to uh, the, the number that mm -hmm. could mm -hmm. evoke quorum, there are other members in committees mm -hmm. within the presence of parliament who well, are also pre considered uh, present. Uh, present. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if it becomes necessary for us to count our numbers, the, we will ring a bell okay. to inform all other members in committees and in fact, on the day, yeah. there were so many committees also sitting yeah. Yeah. to come and register a presence. Right. So the issue of quorum has not been raised in this matter. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it is foreclosed that uh, we, there is no need for us to... If, if, you, look at order, if you look at Order 64.3, this is very clear. A member may draw the attention of the person presiding at any time during a sitting. The members present in the House constitute less than one third of the member of all the members of Parliament. The person okay. presiding shall A, direct the clerks at table to cause the bell to be rung, B, continue the business of the house for a period of 10 minutes, so C, for direct him. the clerks at the table to conduct a head count mm. of members present, and D, if there is still no quorum, suspend the sitting of the house for a period of not more than one hour. And you say, the, the yeah. rules anyway. are yeah. 
It is the member, <laughs> yes, a member. A member. That raises so that, that question. Says, it is not him. This is not his call. Yeah. Yeah. This okay. is not his call. Interesting. So we'll see how it plays out because, um, mm -hmm. it, so is it before the president now, after you're tidying up, do you know? Uh, uh, the president it, says that it's not on his desk. And yeah, this I want was, to the believe president that was speaking um, as on as Tuesday. Wednesday, Tuesday. Tuesday. Uh, as yeah. of the Tuesday, Tuesday. it Tuesday. was not on his desk. But I don't uh, know the situation the, now. The clerk of so uh, let's check. Yeah. Per we, we'll, check we'll check with the clerk of yeah. at the, uh, at the, at the, at the clerk at table. A clerk's yeah. registry mm. to see whether or not this is before him. With this knowledge okay. about the delay, then can the Speaker of Parliament trigger a process for the to quickly make sure that no, it gets it stable. It should be on the president's desk. It is time bound. Yeah. Uh, if, within seven days. If the yeah, search indicates days. that it has been sent to the presidency, then we count seven days. Okay. He must give us a response. Mm -hmm. All right. And uh, beyond that, if he says that I refer to Council of State, and then they have okay. days right. to okay. come back. So within two months, we may have to come to a close. Now that we are not sure that whether it is on the table, who should trigger the process and, and make sure well, we can conduct a search? Yes, uh, uh, we'll uh, see uh, what happens. Uh, yeah. the but the bill was passed on the twenty eighth. Very important the detail there. Yeah. But we'll see how things play out. So, so this is a bill that, to, to, quite, quite honestly, um, the country and beyond are very interested in. So uh, this legal explanations and then also it's some very important detail that you have brought out this morning in our conversation has has added another layer of clarity to the Ghanaian people um, on this particular bill and what, why and it let has us to not be forget, why, Nigeria uh, passed this law and Nigeria has not been sanctioned under any mm -hmm. any provision mm -hmm. or yes. any, any yes. Yes. So yes. The and, and the institutions in Nigeria <laughs> are dealing with uh, so the, the IMF and the world. and again IMF is institution created by all of us, no. yes. including Ghana. It's a bank. It's a bank. Yeah, and a bank. they have specific... give loans and take interest. Yeah. Yeah. interest. And yeah. all yeah. that we are taking yeah. from them, yeah. we are yeah. paying with interest. So we are only look, look, members we've, of we've, one institution we've, we've, we've that is supposed to support of all of us <laughs> in terms of financial support. I mean, Thank you. Now, you're also live here on Key Point, also live on 3FM 92.7. We received over the last four or five months a number of concerns and petitions from you, our viewers, uh, concerning the time for key point. Management has considered over 700 of your petitions about the extension of the time for key point. So let me put it on record today that beginning today, key point ends at 11 a.m. Um, yes, so we'll have a conversation on all the issues to the benefit of you, the Ghanaian people after all the concerns that you have raised. We've taken it into consideration. So I'll be back after this quick break, and uh, we will get into the, the National Cathedral. Some very interesting revelations in there. You don't want to tune off. We'll be back shortly after this quick break, exclusively here on Key Point. Tabel is formulated from unique natural herbs to strengthen teeth and keep gums healthy. Try Colgate Tabel, scientifically proven for strong teeth and healthy gums. This advert is FDA approved. Welcome to Elbooth West Court Oyarifa, your gateway to a comfortable life. Located between Lagon and the tranquil hills of Pediasi, a place where the convenience of city life meet the peaceful embrace of nature here safety peace credibility are assured free from the worries of land guards and multiple patches of the same land oya refresh strategic location offers you easy access everywhere build at your own pace and within your budget rehoboth west court fast selling lands serenity connectivity community own a piece of land today Call 0553-751-933 or 0206-823-524 or visit our website at www.rehobothsocialhousing.com Stagecraft Check Costume Check Rap Check Dr. Panier Check With dreams as big as their hearts Talented Kids contestants this week are ready to showcase their skills and abilities in the fields they aspire to excel. 
my scientific name is Kenneth Lopez Familiaris. Madam, please, I can't pronounce this word. It's pneumono ultra microscopic silicovolcanoconiosis. As the competition heats up, the looming threat of eviction adds tension to the air. What is wrong with you, Semanya? What part of speech is that? Kasakwa. When troubles come, it might To ensure your favorite contestant stays in the competition, vote to the short code star 713 star 13 hash or download the TV3 reality app to vote. Talented kids, free to Talented kids shows on TV3 Sunday at 4 p.m. Powered by Indomie. Sponsored by Coco Plus. Deluxe Acrylic Paint. Frutelli Calipo. Vitamilk. Pepsodent Cavity Fighter. And supported by... Hello everyone, my name is Queen Salom, the winner of Ghana's Most Beautiful 23, the Pride of Water Reason. Catch me live for an excited episode this Ghana month. Recently, you know, the stats show that across to be specific, but Ghana has the worst air quality right now. So almost a decade ago, we're told that 70% of Accra was concretized. And I don't know what they're like now. I mean, that's almost a decade ago, mm. right? As they're coming in, the provisions are not even being made for them. Mm. So they're coming to me, the old thing, the same old things, and mm -hmm. we're all in it. Mm -hmm. Because to get to our other areas, we have a lot of jobs that are there, but it's not really out of people to see that, oh, if I'm here, I can get this thing. <laughs> Have you ever claimed to have seen a famous Ghanaian landmark but actually just saw pictures of it on social media? Oh no, no. Mm -hmm. If you do that one, not you. The Ladies' Circle shows this Saturday at 6 p.m. on TV3. Brought to you by Yaz Sanitary Pad, Onga, Yum Vita, MTN, Cowbell, Our Milk. Expectations are high. Ten families mounted the stage, but only the fittest survive. Get ready to be entertained and surprised as we unveil the eight family set to dominate the big old family dance stage. With heartwarming moments and incredible performances, each family brings their unique flair to the stage. Which family will it be? Big O' Family Dance, big up your mood. Big O' Family Dance Season 2 shows Saturdays at 8 p.m. on TV3. Jojo. What are you expecting tonight? Hmm, something good. That's right. Mr. B is got it out of the block! Too wonderful, mm -hmm. sweet, Ajish. delicious. Ajish. You too fine, eh? He's my spec. I love him. Oh. See the lips. Very kissable. One leg to the right side. Hey. One leg to the. Everybody go down low. Hey. Down low. Hey. Down low. Hey. Hey. So your hidden talent is Google Go. You know how to do it. You it's are very talented. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's that? Ta ta ta. Ta 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 ta. Date Rush shows every Sunday at 8 p.m. on TV3. Don't miss it. Date Rush is sponsored by Head and Black Mosquito Spray and Coil and Napa Foods. They watch up money. Feel moisturizer. Obuasi Bites, Close Up Complete Fresh Protection, Geisha Moringa and Geisha Black Soap, Deluxe Acrylic Paint, Adunku, Remy Spices, Stop Call from Ernest Chemist. And following the program of the contractors and of God helping us, the National Cathedral is expected to be officially commissioned on March 6, 2024. Upon completion, the National Cathedral will provide a sacred space for formal religious activities of state and symbolize the enormous contribution of faith to nation building. It is one person's conviction. The president said that he 
made a pledge to God that if he won the election, he would build a cathedral for him. And so it is his personal pledge. And if he wants to build it, he must gather people who support that conviction to build it. And we were told that public funds were not going to be used for the cathedral. But eventually we found that the Minister of Finance was releasing public taxes. And our taxes are paid by not only Christians, they are paid by Muslims. And so we can't use public funds, including the fund of people of other denominations, to build a cathedral for Christians alone. And so there, there is a very important issue that we must look at. So far, $58 million of public money has been spent just to dig a deep hole. And you have to ask yourself, is it justified in this day and age when children do not have desks in schools, when children do not have textbooks? For five years, we've not provided our basic school children with textbooks, even though we've come out with a new curriculum because we say there's no money. And you say we should use $450 million to build a cathedral. Even God will be angry with us. Well, welcome back to Key Point on TV3, also live on uh, 3FM 92.7, also on TV3 Ghana on Facebook, DSV Channel 279, all across the world on 3news.com. And in addition to all the figures mentioned there, one of the, in fact, the secretary to the Board of Trustees of the National Cathedral is saying that they need additional $250 million to complete the project. If they get that money, that will be done. I don't know if... Uh, Parliament will have a say in this. But this week, the reason why we're even talking about this is that this week, as you heard the former finance minister, Ken Oforiata, uh, mentioned that on the 6th of March, this week was supposed to have been the day for the commissioning of the National Cathedral Project. But as we speak, it is still at the foundation level. And the reason of interest for this conversation is because of how much has been spent so far. What is the feasibility of it being completed before the end of this administration? And especially because of the origin of the cathedral being the president's promise to God. Will the NDC continue it? If they would not continue the cathedral, then who accounts for the public funds that have been already invested in this cathedral at this foundation level? Certainly, some answers have to be given in the interest of the Ghanaian people. And uh, Sheikh Arimi al Shaibu had to leave us to another occasion, a very important one for that matter. He speaks for the National Chief Imam. Um, but Samuel Okuja Tua Blackwa is still with us. Professor Eno Kenchi is still with us. Dionobo and Pia Kubi is still with us. We'll have a couple more people joining us as we go on. But Zablakwa, uh, th this week you, 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 together with your colleague, Minority MP, you see Sam George and then also Jachi Kwesin. You went to do uh, what, what has been described as a <laughs> symbolic commissioning. You had your own... <laughs> ribbons and balloons <laughs> what was that for <clears throat> yes yeah, so it's important to emphasize that i'm not aware of any project which will require such a staggering amount of money and all of us as citizens particularly in this period of considerable economic crisis. Mm -hmm. We are desperately at the IMF seeking a bailout. We have been shut out of the financial market. We have been declared insolvent, bankrupt. The sovereign rating agencies have downgraded us to junk status, whether it's Fitch, Moody's, Standard & Poor's. We are all being forced to take financial haircuts, even pensioner bondholders. You saw senior citizens, what they had to go through, demonstrate, picket the Ministry of Finance before they can have access to their own money they have worked for. 
the economic crisis is so bad that even bonds, government bonds, which we thought, the literature has always said is risk-free, it's one of the safest investments you can make, no longer safe. We have defaulted on our loan obligations as a country. So this is the context that we find ourselves. Mm -hmm. And yet, we have only discovered recently that when the president assured this nation that this is personal pledge to God, mm -hmm. they would not use taxpayer funds. And he told the clergy, so you recall that Archbishop Nicholas Duncan Williams made a clarion call to the nation mm -hmm. that all of those who are criticizing the project should desist, that they were not using public funds. They have been assured by the president. Mm -hmm. Viewers can Google that, you'll see it. Archbishop Nicholas Duncan Williams, who until recently was a member of the Board of Trustees. Mm -hmm. We have discovered that unknown to parliament, without parliamentary approval, a colossal $58.1 million has so far been spent. Now, $58.1 million, million dollars has been spent so far has been spent on, the on what is now being described as the world's most expensive pit. $58 million. For the foundation. Yes, just, just the foundation. Uh, what, and, 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 if and where have, did that money come from? If you what have, the source of that, that, that? If you have any doubt, I have the letter here written to Parliament. Mm -hmm. You know, during the vote of censure hearings, we asked the Minister for Finance that, look, we have intercepted a number of documents you mm -hmm. have signed, instructing the Controller and Counter General to release funds mm -hmm. to the National Cathedral Secretariat. Mm -hmm when we had been told that it's a personal pledge, you are not going to use public funds. Yes. So now we want you to write to the committee, the vote of censure committee, mm -hmm. and list all the times you carried out these uh, illegal withdrawals. So the finance minister responded on the 21st of November, 2022, and provided this breakdown. So I have here the breakdown. Breakdown of the amount released so far for the National Cathedral Project. 7th June 2019, the finance minister authorized the release of $89,000. That's mm -hmm. 445,000 cities at the time. 5th March 2021, $80,525,000. Good, you have a copy. And this was a payment of consultancy services in respect of the design of the, of the National of Cathedral. The design of the National Cathedral. The first one was a payment of advanced mobilization for consultation working on the design of the National Cathedral. Fantastic. That's 445 million. Then, 445, then 10 February. 10 February, payment of another payment consultancy, of consultancy service. service. That's to the 32 design. million. So David Ajay alone, the architect, has so far received 113 million. That is $19.6 million. So the $58 million, David Ajay alone received $19.6 million. And talk to all the industry experts. They say this doesn't happen. This is outside industry practice, where $58 million for a project, and the architect alone is getting number 40%. You take 29th October 2021, the finance minister, on our blind side, without parliamentary approval, released another $142.7 million. That was $25 million. Hmm. And he says, Government of Ghana contribution to the National Cathedral Secretariat to enable commencement of planned activities. If you say government then, of Ghana contribution, that's the Ghanaian people's money. Yes, Ghanaian people's money, our money, our taxes. When you have told us, and you see, what is even so shocking is that a citizen of Ghana, James Kovner Bonfair, who I know very well, he contested me in the Nooks presidency. He really gave yeah, me he gave me a hot chase, yeah, from <laughs> UCC. Um, he, he came second. He almost yeah. defeated me, you know. So I know him very well. His uh, his, his nickname is Kabila. Yes, he Kabila. went to the Supreme Court. That look, this project will open the floodgates. If you say national cathedral for Christians, soon Muslims will say they also want a national mosque. Soon traditionalists will say they also want a national shrine. So the Supreme Court should declare this project, which in a secular state, uh, all of us pay taxes, as you heard former President Muhammad saying. Mm -hmm. How fair is it to take taxes from all of us, including atheists, pagans, traditionalists, and all of that, and you are building for only one? We are, you haven't told us that after the National Cathedral, you will build a national mosque or a national shrine. So the Supreme Court should declare this project unconstitutional. The Attorney General, <coughs> in his response, says that mm -hmm. James Kovner Bonfair is not well informed. The president and the clergy have already assured the nation that our taxes will not be used. So his fears are unfounded. 
And that is how come Kwabna Bonfe lost the case. It was dismissed. Mm -hmm. Only for us to discover these documents. And let me continue. The finance minister then again tells us that on the 19th of August 2021, 19th of August 2021 he released another 58.2 million. And this was additional government of Ghana contribution to the National Cathedral Secretariat I mean, for the I construction. Mean, when, when, did, when did the people of Ghana tell this finance minister that you can take our taxes for this project? He didn't stop there. 31st March 2022, another government of Ghana contribution for the construction of the National Cathedral. 25 million. That was $3.5 million. And as we speak, 339 million has been sunk into this pit, the world's most expensive pit. That's $58.1 million. And you see, what is even shocking? And this, Alfred, this, this, this <clears throat> figure is contained in the document emanating from the finance, from the finance ministry, ministry. Yes. to the, to the Vote of Censure Committee, Committee. Parliament. Of we'll Ghana. put a, a, so, that page on the screen. Yes, so this, yeah. these are not figures I am making up. You know, and it was signed by the chief director of the Ministry of Finance, Mr. Patrick Nomo, on behalf of the minister, the Honorable Kanufuriata, dated 21st November 2022. It says, re, motion on vote of censure against the Honorable Minister for Finance, request for information. Reference is made to the proceedings of the ad hoc committee on Friday, 18 November 2022. And your letter dated 21st November 2022, the Ministry of Finance writes to forward the underlisted information in fulfillment of the agreement reached during the proceedings. One, total amount spent by government on the National Cathedral of Ghana as to date. See Appendix 1. So it is not my own document or I'm not conjecturing here. Mm -hmm. Now, Alfred, will you believe that after all of these releases, the contractor Ribade JV abandoned site March 14th, 2022, two years ago. Why? For lack of payment. Lack of payment? When all these monies have been released? When all these monies have been released. So, so, so where did the monies go? That is what triggered my interest in this whole affair. That look, first of all, you are proceeding on deception. Look, if there's any project as Christians, as believers, if there's any project which must meet the high Christian standards of integrity, of purity, holiness, righteousness, lawfulness. It is this project. So when I started intercepting these documents from patriots who said, that, look, we are being deceived. So Honorable Kujato Ablakwa, come for all of these documents and go to parliament and find out what's happening. Then I decided to pursue further only to discover that on the 14th of March 2022, the contractor, Ribade JV, and Ribade is a joint venture of three companies, Rizani the Echa, Babisoti, and Di Simone. Right. They have written to all their staff that, look, this project, we are not receiving payments. They owe us so much. So all of you go home. March 14th. 2022. I have that yes. to the staff of to this three. Yes, that they should go home. That they should go home. You have a yes. copy. Yes, I do. And and so for two years now, no work has been going on. And you ask yourself, where is all that money? So I decided to 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 follow the money. Mm -hmm. Then I discovered that another gentleman called Carrie Summers, Carrie who Summers says he's the... a fundraiser. He raises I funds. Think he's on the the cathedral yes. website. website. Mm. Uh, he's presented as a fundraiser and in charge of their U.S. operations. Now, what I know about fundraising for projects of this nature is that if you're a fundraiser, you raise the funds and you are given a commission, percentage, a percentage commission. of it as commission. But in the case of Ghana, against best practice, this man is giving $6 million to go and raise funds for us. Up to now, he hasn't raised anything. He was giving sixty million dollars for what? For fundraising. That's what we were told. Now, what was the system? In advance. So In advance. No, but he, he was not supposed to raise funds. Yes. So what was the six million dollars? To go for? and use to raise funds. No, to use the money to raise to funds. To raise funds. That he's a consultant for fundraising. I don't understand that. What do you mean? Nobody understands it. But what happened is that he was giving our taxes six million dollars uh, no. to go raise funds. 
<laughs> and you got this information from it's, where? It's here, if you look at the document submitted to Parliament. By oh, the so National this is in the document yes. for, submitted to Parliament? Submitted to Parliament. By who? By the National Cathedral Secretariat. That they give? Six million dollars to the CEO of the Nehemiah Group. And that's Carrie Summers. And remember, I followed up, I've gone to the United States mm -hmm. of America and I've gone to discover that he's really no CEO of Nehemiah Group. He's uh, selling coffee in some ramshackle warehouse and hasn't raised a dime for us. You're selling coffee? Yes, in a ramshackle warehouse, Kari <laughs> You said ramshackle. Yes. I, I went there. I went to Missouri. I think I saw a picture yes. of him. But was he the one? At the yes, he's the one. Yes, he came out. Yes, I saw him. He is, the, look. And you the confirmed things that, that he's have selling coffee? Yes, yes. <laughs> selling coffee in a ramshackle warehouse. I see. This is somebody who is supposed to be raising funds for us. And it doesn't happen anywhere. If the claims he's making, he really has those international contacts and the network to raise the funds. He should bring the money and you give him a percentage. That is what happens. That's mm -hmm. the best practice. And for a country under such considerable economic crisis, throwing money away like that. So are you therefore surprised that after all of this investment, remember when Bishop Dakiwad Mills was resigning? He wrote in his letter, at the time, $30 million had been spent. Mm -hmm. And he said it didn't sit well in his conscience for $30 million to be spent. And all he sees is a pit. That is why he resigned. Mm -hmm. Then I also decided that, look, yes, you've breached the Constitution. You have not uh, come for parliamentary approval. How about our procurement laws? So I raised an RTI request, a right mm -hmm. to information request, on the 4th of July, 2022, mm -hmm. to the Public Procurement Authority right. to find out if they know about the National Cathedral Project and if they have granted approval. And then I also decided to ask what kind of procurement method was used. Is it single source, sole source? Was it a competitive process? So a two-page RTI request, mm -hmm. which I signed on the 4th of July, 2022, by the next day, 5th July 2022, the PPA responds because it was just an easy thing for them to do. And I was shocked at the response. Alfred, listen to the PPA. This is signed by the Chief Executive of the Public Procurement Authority, mm -hmm. Mr. Fragmante. And he says, reference is made to your RTI request of 4th July 2022 on the subject above. Please be informed that the Public Procurement Authority holds no information relating to the construction of the National Cathedral by Ribade Company Limited. Hmm. You may wish to refer your inquiry to the National Cathedral Secretary. And this you are, are reading you from this? where? The, what document is this? This is from the Public Procurement yeah, request, request. From the Public Procurement Authority. Okay. Incredible. Unbelievable. Hmm. A $450 million project. And the PPA has no information. They said they don't have any information. They say they have no information on it. They have absolutely no information that I should go to National Cathedral Secretariat. I mean, are we in some <coughs> banana republic? Is it some jungle? And we say we are building for God, the Almighty. The God who stopped David from building for him because he said that David was not pure at the time. And this is what we are doing. So I decided to look further into this project. Then I discovered that, look, we will even be wrong if we thought that it's only 58 million dollars we have spent so far i found out that apparently on everybody's blind side so many demolitions have no, happened no, not to interrupt you but this is the current state of the yes. cathedral yes that's that how it looks like yes we got the 58.1 million an aerial image of it yes this is what this, this is situation. this is this, this is, is what we have done with 58.1 million dollars Recently, I saw in the news that uh, if we got 56 million euros, we can have a very modern La General Hospital. You know, after mm -hmm. the demolition yeah. of La General. So we will, have, we will have a very huge, modern, well-equipped La General Hospital. But this is what we have for $58 million. But it's not surprising because the contractor says he was not receiving payment, so he abandoned the project. Carrie Summers is keeping $6 million out of this $58 million. David Ajayi took $19.6 million. So monies were not going to the core mandate, the core responsibility. Of building. Of building. So it is not surprising. Now, I was going to make the point about the other financial obligations that have arisen because of the model that was adopted, which I call a reckless model. Why? So 
If you recall, Bishop Ducky Ward Mill said in his resignation letter that when the president met them, the president said he already had his architect, he already has decided on the location. Mm -hmm. So the board of trustees, the pastors, the eminent clergy, didn't have a hand in the location. So I probed further, and I discovered that there have been so many demolitions on, a, on, 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 on everybody's blind side. Hmm. Guess what? As we speak, the Malian ambassador's residence has been demolished. The, the, Malian, the Malian ambassador's residence, it was in that enclave. It's been demolished. The last time I engaged the Malians, they have been promised land at airport residential. And we will have to build for them. You know the cost of land at airport residential. Absolutely. That is not part of the $58 million. Then there is the passport head office, which was also demolished. Mm -hmm. As ranking member of the Foreign Affairs Committee, I know that it has cost us 10 million cities to build a new one for them near GIJ. Yes. That the is bread. not part of the $58 million. Then scholarship secretariat has also been demolished. And look at the rich history. I'm glad there's an academic here. The number of, look, elsewhere, that building will be so preserved. Because mm -hmm. of people like Kofi Annan, mm -hmm. Professor Mills, and all of these people who have gone through there with scholarship, you know, uh, packages, it will have been preserved. It's been demolished. They are not lucky to get a replacement. So they, there's no replacement. Then let me bring you to judges' bungalows. Do you know that judges' bungalows there? In the process, a very respected appeal court judge, he was so upset how he was just hurriedly told to leave, that the, uh, the president has seen a vision. God has spoken to him that uh, he, he's, he must uh, be in Accra. So everybody must move, move away from that location. He resigned, Justice Said resigned because of that. Because of this? Because, you know? yes. The way Amana, he was asked to evacuate. How many of those um, I'm, judges' I'm, bungalows were demolished? More than 20, I'm told. More than 20. And in the process, you know that these judges' bungalows, when Speaker Bagbin was works and housing minister not too long ago, mm -hmm. they were constructed. So new buildings, you know, in, 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 in great condition. Do you know that it has cost us money to take care of the temporary relocation of the judges <coughs> in... Uh, some apartments which for security reasons uh, we have to protect our judges I cannot reveal the address. In, in a yeah. prime area? Prime area. Which I, I, and I, then we are now building new bungalows for the judges. All of this cost is not part of the 58 million dollars. Then let me come to the Judicial Training Institute. Ghana had a Judicial Training Institute where you know lawyers, jurists Jury. come for capacity building, particularly in the Commonwealth, very, you know, respected edifice and, and, and a whole, you know, people like uh, the respected Sir Dennis, mm -hmm. you know, yes. very eminent, you know, jurist mm -hmm. uh, has been uh, a, a, a facilitator there for many, many years. Mm -hmm. The Judicial Training Institute was demolished. As we speak, the judiciary has put together a budget. Do you know how much they need to replace to build a new judicial training institute? How much? Fifty million dollars. Fifty million dollars. Fifty million dollars. And this is separate from this the is 50, separate from the fifty eight million. million dollars. Then there is a company called Waterstone Realty mm -hmm. Apartment Complex. They had a luxury apartment complex. They were writing, creating jobs for the youth and all of that. It was also demolished. They are in court seeking compensation. Then there is another private firm called the Comsys IT firm. Comsys. Comsys, yes, that's it. Very well known. Well known. You know, Comsys. Their headquarters was also demolished. <laughs> Comsys is now being relocated around Laboni. You know the cost of land at Laboni. Mm -hmm. That is not all. Bangalows, uh, bungalows belonging to Shraj were also demolished. At that same location. That same location. This look, that location is such a prime location. And you wonder, look, couldn't we have cited this project at a greenfield, even on the outskirts? Look, for many years, we have complained about the congestion in the central business district. When there is one program at, in, uh, at the Accra International Conference Center, the whole place is choked. Mm -hmm. It becomes even a security risk. We can't even go to parliament. Mm -hmm. The last time there was a call to the bar, I mean, it was, it, you couldn't move. 
-hmm. We've been talking about decongesting the central business district and that enclave for years. So even if we come to an agreement as a nation that we should do such a project, and I'm not sure we'll have even agreed that it should be at such a cost, over $450 million. So, so this $58.1 million has to be put in the right context that it has come with so many hidden costs. Now, let me also come to the agreement. Because I recall that the, the lands minister was in Parliament, the, I think last year or so, yes. indicated that all these persons were affected by the demolition for this con construction of National Cathedral have been compensated. Uh, that, 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 that is... He said this before you. Yes, yes, he said that. And we challenged him. It's not accurate. He is aware of the, the pending suit by... Uh, Waterstone Realty. That's about some, for some $5 million. Yes, they, they're demanding $5 million. And then if you take the scholarship secretariat, mm -hmm. they have not been compensated. If you take the judiciary, the Judicial Training Institute, they, 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 they have they need $50 million. They, they need $50 million. I saw what uh, former Chief Justice Eni Yeboah put together. $50 million. And they are now moving from, they've gone to ECOWAS Bank for reconstruction, gone to World Bank, trying to see if they can get some external support for this project. Now, Alfred, I must also point to you that if you look at the 13 point demand we made mm -hmm. and the <coughs> media engagement, one of the things that we have drawn attention to is how bad the contract is. I have a copy here. And two years on after the contractor left site, mm -hmm. we are incurring costs as a nation, if you look at the contract. Because there are provisions like standing time claims. So as you ask the contractor to hold on, mm -hmm. you are not paying the contractor. Mm -hmm. Cost is being incurred. Uh -huh. There's, there's another, another contractual provision here known as extension of time claims and mm -hmm. cost implication of sale. So you promise and you agree with the contractor that you will carry out your obligation, you release funds, mm -hmm. you pay them, and you commission this project on the 6th of March this year. Mm -hmm. That is why we had to carry out that action because it's a significant day. Mm -hmm. That's the day you told Parliament, you told the Ghanaian people, when you told God that you commissioned it. As you haven't met this timeline mm -hmm. and there's an extension, it comes at a cost if you look at the contract. Then so, there's another provision here called the abortive and reworks costs mm -hmm. due to main contractor suspension. We are also going to pay for that. Ah. It's such a bad contract. That is why we are saying that this contract should be abrogated. That is, if, if, if this project is aborted, the contractor will have to be paid. Yes. Well, I mean, and, and, that's, and, 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 you, and, you, you would understand why the contractor would yes, put that clause uh, in there. So, so we are saying that, look, why are we still incurring costs when you can sit with all the parties and terminate? Look, there is no way. The... Uh, uh, the cathedral board, I heard Reverend Kusib Watin, and yes. I'm surprised that you know, after all of these double he, identity he, matters, he's still out there. This matter is still in court, he, huh? Uh, no, the Human Rights Court has determined this, this, it. This, is, is, this he, matter. It's clear that you know, he has questions to answer. The judge said he didn't even know who, she didn't even know who was before her, whether it's Kusib Watin or, or, or Edu Jemfi. He says that you he, know, they need extra 250 or 250 million dollars. Million. Look, that is, why, the that is why if you look at the 13 demands we made on the present, we are saying that the board of trustees, the, the remnants, those who are left on the board, we know that Bishop Dark Edward Mills has resigned, Pastor Otabel has left, uh, Archbishop Nicholas Duncan Williams has resigned, Reverend Sudanaba has resigned. We are saying that those who are left, the board should be dissolved. We are also saying that the National Cathedral Secretariat should be shut down. Look. We attach the structure of the National Cathedral Secretary to the media, mm -hmm. and uh, your people can put it up. It is such a tax guzzler, a very humongous bureaucracy, which is well, costing us so much. Already, if you look at the documents Ken Ufriata brought to Parliament, they have released $225 million to this secretariat. It's such a tax guzzler. The national they have, yes, they have board okay, of trustees. We, we, have, we have a page on yes. that. Let, let's put that they on the screen. They have board let's. trustees, board of trustees. Then you have mm -hmm. the board secretary. You have the executive director. Then you have consultants, one of whom is Carrie Summers, keeping at $6 million. You have secretary. 
Then you have those in charge so of operations. this is operations. The, page, the page you are making reference. No, that is, no, that is the breakdown of the cost. The, of the cost. This is the organogram. No, I'm, 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 uh, yes. I'm speaking <laughs> to the organogram. So, so yes. no, I, I want to confirm that indeed 225 million has oh, yes, already been. Oh, yes, yes. To the mm. National Criteria Security. Let's go, up, let's go up a bit. Yeah, let's go. Let's go up a bit. I think that yes. 225, 225 million. You is, see is, yeah. is, is, is down there. Yes. Yes. Given to the National Cathedra Secretariat. That's okay. it. You see it there. 225. When you mm -hmm. add uh, those three releases to them, it's 225 million. So I'm back to the organogram. Mm -hmm. So you have people in charge of operations, construct me and finance, revenue mobilization, uh, cathedral church affairs, museums and gardens, communications. Then there's an office manager. You have a secretarial staff. You have volunteers. You have interns. Then you have national service personnel. It's, 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 this secretariat is quite a leverage, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And we are saying that. Why should we keep paying these people every month? Two years now, no work is going on. Why should we keep incurring this cost? And we say we are broke. Because of that, we are allowing some foreigners to be you know, intimidating us. We can't even pass our own laws and have our peace of mind. You know, because we say we are desperate for money. And yet, look at our conduct. Look at what, how we are wasting money. So that's the, 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 one of the demands. The other demand we have made is that so far, government hasn't told us the total cost of compensation. All these people who they've demolished their properties and they are compensated, they haven't finished though, we want to know the cost so we can add it to the 58.1 million dollars. <coughs> we are also saying that if you look at the people who are keeping these sums of money, there ought to be retrievers. Look, this project is clearly dead. David Ajay should return our 19.6 million dollars. Karisame should return our $6 million. Mm -hmm. Reverend Kusi Bwati in Kwabna Edujefi should return our $2.6 million. Right. Cities. We are making that demand strongly. Then we are also saying that on the 24th of January 2023, mm -hmm. the National Cathedral, Cathedral Board of Trustees issued a statement that they have invited Deloitte, because of all the scandals mm -hmm. associated with this project, they've cool. invited Deloitte to audit the account. We are saying, where is that audit report? It's been more than a year. And the, that, that audit report has not been made public? It's not been made public. It has not been submitted to you? Except uh, Bryce Simmons of Imani, mm -hmm. who recently told us that it is such a damning report. And, so the and, audit has been and, done? And that, yes, that from what Imani is saying, that they have some uh, intelligence that is been done, but it's damning, and they, they, that's why it's not being published. We are urging the Board of Trustees to keep their promise. They promise us in their 12, 24th January 2023 statement that they will make the audit report public. They should publish that report. We are also appealing to Shraj. You know that on the 16th of January last year, I petitioned Shraj on the conflict of interest aspect of this whole National Cathedral Bruhaha. That petition, Shraj has only dealt with the preliminary case where, you know, Ken uh, Ofoyata, Kusibwati, Edu Jenfi, there is a preliminary objection, which they lost. Shiraj dismissed it. But the substantive matter, we are still waiting for Shiraj, and we appeal to Shiraj to expedite action. We are also saying that our colleagues on the MPP side, you remember that I filed a motion. The speaker admitted it. Mm -hmm. We debated the motion as a house. Nobody raised an objection. We passed a resolution that we should probe the matter. We should have a bipartisan parliamentary probe. What is left? is for our colleagues on the MPP side to submit the names of their members who serve on the committee. They have not done that for six months now. We have submitted our names to the speaker. Because I was just going to come to that, because you've been consistent on this exposés on, on, on your own as a, a citizen and also a member of parliament. But then again, you belong to a, a house that is supposed to ensure accountability and checks and balances on the executive. Now, so after all of these exposés and uh, the advocacy that you've been on, Parliament, what is Parliament doing to get some accountability and some answers on behalf of the Ghanaian people if indeed the audit has been done? Why can't Parliament get, get, get it to, to, to be made public? So the only way forward is for this parliamentary probe to commence. And there is enormous public interest in this matter. We are there to serve the Ghanaian people. We cannot derelict. We cannot abdicate. We have debated this motion. Everybody in the House, mm -hmm. both sides of the House, agreed that this is a very relevant matter. It borders on protecting the national purse. Mm -hmm. 
Nobody raised an objection. We passed a resolution that we will have the inquiry. Then suddenly, feed dragging. Our colleagues are not presenting their names. Every Friday after the reading of the business statement, I rise up to remind the majority leader that they cannot continue to stonewall, to put impediments in the way of the Ghanaian people. So I am hoping, because look, the last time I, I, I made a submission on the floor that, look, if you look at referrals to committees, you check with the clerk at the table, there have been about 700 referrals to committees that are yet to receive action. And I said that, look, we are not covering ourselves in glory as a house. Right. So we must, we, 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 we must chart a new path. All right. I also reminded the house that if you look at what happened in parliament in 2013, mm -hmm. when our colleagues on the MPP side decided that they would not vet President Mohammed's ministers because there's a pending challenge of the election results at the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't want to give President Mahama that legitimacy. They boycotted uh, every matter in parliament that relates to him or a referral from him. So his ministers, they didn't participate on the appointments committee. Okay. We went ahead. It was a one-sided house because parliamentary boycotts are part of democratic tools in the toolkit, mm -hmm. which can be used. So I am urging the house that okay. if our colleagues will not submit their names, to serve on the committee. There are members who should serve on the committee. We should go ahead. Nothing stops us under our standing orders under the Constitution of Ghana to have one side doing its work. But okay. what, what right. would be such a travesty is if Parliament abdicates in this matter and we do not take on uh, this oversight duty. Okay. Then finally, we are also saying that it's important for the prosecuting agencies to bring a case of causing financial loss to the state. Mm -hmm. People who are keeping all these fantastic sums of money should not be allowed. I mean, look. So you're, you're, you, you're, so you're going to bring a case of causing at, financial loss I have to the a, state? I have a copy of our annual public debt report. You will see here, sometimes we go for loans, $2 million, $3 million. <laughs> 5 million. <laughs> and yet, Harry Summers is keeping... Uh, is keeping Six million dollars. Look at the brouhaha in parliament yesterday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, the amount, it was over 300 million dollars. Mm -hmm. That's what we were so desperately, you know, fighting for. 300 million dollar loan yesterday. This cathedral is going to cost us 450 million dollars. It started at 100 million dollars. You've heard uh, Reverend Kusi Boatin, Kwabna Edu Jemfi, say that they need 250 million dollars more. Yes. So, so, so we cannot continue to just be <coughs> dissipating scarce resources. It's not as if we have the money. It's not as if we are in a good place economically. So, let me so, 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 as I conclude, as I conclude, it, I, I also think that you in the media should help us have a national debate on even what we should do with that pit. Well, so that's a question I was going to, because in the end, you see, that pit has been created. What the foundation has been created, mm -hmm. money has been sunk in there. You're saying that you're going to, to demand some action be taken in, with regards to causing financial loss to the state. It clearly indicates that the NDC is not interested in building this cathedral. It's not going to happen, assuming that you win 2024. You're not going to continue this project. Look, uh, I agree with the TUC. I agree with Archbishop Nicholas Zanka Williams and Reverend Sudandaba, who have said that, look, in principle, even though they are for a cathedral, they think it can be scaled down, okay. even if it should be built. My view is that Let's have a national debate. The TUC is proposing a hospital. I have received petition from citizens who say that Ghana lacks a, a, a proper children's hospital, a modern, pediatric, a, a modern pediatric. pediatric center, that let us consider that. I think that all of these proposals are in the right direction. Okay. And at a right. much lower, you know, cost, you know, we we'll can see. have something more beneficial that will be more pleasing to God than than, than what we are doing on a foundation of deception, wrongdoing, and uh, lack of transparency. Uh, no, we are, we are Kobe, and mm -hmm. having listened to this detail, and it was important that I let me put out this detail, yes. and also being one of the senior members of parliament on the other side, the NPP. I mean, the fundamental concern here is 
some level of accountability, clarity. As to how this 58 million that has been sunk in so far has been spent, which is government, I mean, the taxpayers' money essentially. And then also these compensations that have been given out to people, which parliament you know, hasn't been giving full detail of. That is, even if you have the detail at all. And so a probe should be able to bring out such answers, at least for the Ghanaian people, is it not? Yes, for me, uh, the first issue is about who is doing what. Mm -hmm. Because it is even not clear whether it's a private project, whether it's a government project. So let's uh, bring clarity to that issue. Uh, the concept document, uh, how was it designed, and who was to take what, and who was to fund it. Because uh, some refers to uh, some conversation that mm -hmm. suggests that they were going to do it with private funding. Mm -hmm. If it was conversation alone, without documentation, that's uh, a lot of problem there. Let me understand uh, and uh, uh, which authority did we even envisage developing uh, the National Cathedral, number one. In that, we will be able to find who are the interested parties. And again, we are discussing the contract uh, for construction of the buildings. Who are the parties in that contract? It's important for mm -hmm. me to know. Uh, and if we make reference to the contract, we will see who is instructing who and for what, uh, what contractual terms. It's important for us to understand that. Um, there was mention of releases of finances. Mm -hmm. uh, who is at the other end of the transaction? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to believe that, and uh, some is referring to Minister of Finance all the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who has received what? It's important for us to know. Yeah. The National Cathedral Secretariat, Rebade. Now, National Sec uh, 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 Cathedral Secretariat. Yes. Yeah. As what entity, with what capacity to do the things they want to do? Uh, is it uh, a legal person with capacity to do the things that a proposed to wants to do? Like, you know, there are a lot yeah. of questions yeah. around. Let's find out. And again, uh, are there any audit reports? Are these reports uh, delivered to who? For whose consideration? Is the Auditor General also aware of these payments and has the Auditor General also captured this in the audit reports mm -hmm. and how have we dealt with it? These are issues. But all that put together, I think we can find solution in Article 41F of our Constitution. What? Oh, okay. And with your kind permission, maybe right. you I will read that for me. Read that um, for you. Article 41, and the exercise and enjoyment of rights and freedoms is inseparable from the performance, from the performance of duties and obligations. And accordingly, it shall be the duty of every Ghanaian, every Ghanaian, mm. and we go to four, to protect and preserve public property and expose and combat misuse of waste of public funds and property. Mm -hmm. And when this right is to be enjoyed with responsibilities mm -hmm. yeah. and the Constitution enjoins all of us to protect and prevent the usage and wastage, it then becomes a mandate bestowed on us as citizens. Mm -hmm to be able to probe and stop such waste and mismanagement of public funds. And where do we go? Mm -hmm. Then it means it directs us to a course. It gives us capacity on which, on this constitutional provision to go to court. It is not enough to be out there lamenting and shouting us and saying that we demand this, that doesn't come. Let us use the appropriate legal means mm -hmm. to make such uh, demands of 
persons so identified in the scheme of things. So that if Apia could be has been in the receiving end of some money, then the court directs another towards me that Apia could be deliver this money to account number so so and so for reason that you are found culpable for having taken uh, this money which otherwise ought not to have been given to you. I am only directing that beyond the agitations, beyond the lamentations, the constitution provides us with um, a route to, through which we can also seek the redress that we are expecting. Because if we are in the, in the public space shouting that I expect this to come, it may not come because we are not shouting to anybody. But let us um, bundle out our claims through the law and forward them to the appropriate contest with uh, appropriate orders of the court to compare performance. There we will be sure that we are dealing with Mr. A, Mr. B, mm -hmm. Mr. B. But the way we are going and dealing with unknown people in the air, we may do that years on years on. We may not get the necessary responses. So, he mentions... Well, I'm not sure about that because I'm a church, a petition church. Mm -hmm. uh, there are aspects of it in court. Because mm -hmm. um, he brought yes. to court, he's, he's well, lost. Well, those were He's lost, he's lost three rounds already. That, you that know, does not then, address... Then, uh, then there's also a motion before parliament. Mm -hmm. we, we filed a motion. Listen, so, Sami, I'm uh, doing, I'm doing my best uh, somebody takes you to court so, yeah. on defamation, yeah. it doesn't affect this. This is a mandate bestowed on citizens. How about the charge petition? This, well, I, this I just want you to know the various yeah, aspects. The the petition. Petition. Yes, but uh, I don't know the That's reliefs we there appeal, also. We are appealing to Shrike. I, I don't know the reliefs also there. But this one... Is, That's on conflict of interest. Mm. On the monies. Yeah. I am not interested in um, whether or not this was right, this was not right. I am interested in the two yeah. of monies expended in this So budget. the parliamentary probe so, will help. The parliamentary probe, mm -hmm. uh, well, it, yes. it may and, identify and, certain but, flaws, but, no, no, but I'm know. saying yeah. that I'm interested in how to retrieve the money. And I'm developing this channel that this is how we can deliver the I, money. And, and how, how do you propose that the money should be retrieved, could be retrieved? The money to the Constitution says that uh, you, as a person, Ghanaian, okay. you are vested with mandate, capacity, to prosecute a nation to retrieve this money. And this is as, as what, a provision. Go to court. Eh? Go to court. To seek what? To causing seek... financial loss to the state? No, no. Retrieve this money. Causing financial loss to the state is a criminal matter. That one is criminal. It's, it's but only, only we are not interested in the criminal aspect. The so, criminal aspect, the mandate by the Constitution rests with the Attorney General. You want the, the And citizen... the Attorney General may decide whether or not it's justiciable uh, to go to court on this matter. And the only way we can compel so, so, a so, so, so it's honorable suggesting to that a mandamus order. Yeah. And it's a long process. Yeah. I'm not but, probably but, but honorable, are you therefore suggesting that the government itself should not be interested in retrieving this money? But that am, only citizens it, the, see, no no because, I'm not, I'm because, not suggesting that. Because what I'm saying is that because if you look uh, at the constitution of the, what haven't I done? I have advocated. Listen, we have even uh, led Sammy, matches. Sammy, listen, We've done listen, media listen, engagement. Listen, We've gone to shrine. Okay. We are I, I, I have filed motions in parliament. Thank you. In there. Thank you for your. Yeah. And yeah. I'm also bringing mm -hmm. out an alternative way. You have made the appeals to government, whatever institutions. You are not getting the results. And I'm saying that there is also a constitutional conduit through which we can seek the same reliefs. And I'm also showing you that uh, through Article 41F, you are close with capacity to go to court and get court to make certain pronouncements directed at persons and institutions to bring A, B, C, D. So I'm sure that probably that would be the better way to mm. seek redress by way of retrieving all these lost funds. Because in matters of causing financial loss, you don't have capacity because the Constitution doesn't give you that right. Yeah, that's for the Attorney General. And the Attorney General may decide to go or not to go. So it doesn't rest in your hands. What rests in your hands is a civil action through the courts for retrieval of those monies. And I urge you to continue with that. You mentioned somebody has having taken uh, six million. Yeah. The six million, how did he take it? Who gave it to him? 
under what circumstance, under what contract. Let's look at investigating there's all no that. Contract. And no, then there's see no contract with no uh, Sanders? No. Well, no so contract. For, under what the contract was he given the so, money? National Cathedral Secretary so, gave him the money. So it means that we need to do further work on that to find who has done what. And in case there is negligence on the part of any public officer, you see, uh, and I continue to say that let us criminalize professional negligence. Uh, you cannot bring an action in negligence to retrieve damages. But that may not necessarily be enough. I mean, if I negligently cause loss of six million and you sue, uh, well, you bring an action in tort, sue me on negligence and I even bring the six million. Is that enough to uh, punish my criminal mind? Then it means that if we criminalize professional negligence, then the engineer who would have supervised a road to my village and didn't do a good job, paid him without him doing good work, will also come under criminal negligence. So, I mean, but that does not exist so far in our, our statute books. Mm -hmm. So, let's find a way to retrieve that money. And this, I'm saying that the contract for the construction, we can easily identify the parties in the contract and mm -hmm. see whether even those people are clothed with adequate capacity to even go into contracting. Whether the contracts, the content of the contracts provide issues of unconscionability, we can also look at that and see okay. how unconscionable some of the contracts have been. And the reliefs available to us have been suffered unconscionable contracting. We, you see, so all that I'm suggesting is that mm -hmm. we cannot be satisfied by only throwing our hands in the air and expecting uh, somebody who may not be interested in providing answers to our questions, when the law also gives us the route to go through the court. Um, the trustees of the Board of uh, National Cathedral, I'm sure they understood the terms of their engagement, and they knew the consequences of their participation, and whether or not even the trustees, the board, um, the National Cathedral Board is registered as a limited liability company or public interest company, I am not aware of that. And if people came on the board knowing their, 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 their responsibilities and that their fiduciary relationship with the entity and the consequences thereof, and having come on it, then they are answerable for their actions uh, mm -hmm. against, the, uh, you see, we can bring such people to come and also respond to our questions. I see. Um, but but and on, you are saying that uh, we have a list of members of parliament uh, having been selected by the minority. Yes. Yeah, so that's I want to find out why. If you have any idea why your side and, has not uh, nominated uh, your reps I'm not aware of that, to the honestly, committee, to I'm not the, aware. and I indeed, see. no such uh, order will be directed at me to provide any list because okay. I'm not in it. Indeed, I, I said. But would. it is also possible for the speaker himself. If he is finding difficulty getting people from one side or through the leadership, it's possible for him to nominate people mm -hmm. and say, I select ABCD from a minority, EFGH from majority. And, and if he is so minded. Yes, that's the speaker's committee. And it's a committee of the speaker, it's a committee of the house. So you will do what otherwise the committee to be selected by uh, leadership of uh, majority and minority would do. So it is not foreclosed that because somebody is not appointing people from, uh, I have not been contacted to be to serve on any such committee. Okay. So the speaker can appoint. Uh, the wastage, the expectation of prosecution uh, on the wastage, on the uh, uh, law of causing financial laws. I'm sure you also okay. understand that uh, you are limited by that claim because Constitution didn't give you the power to prosecute, okay. and therefore yeah. you can only just make a complaint, and your complaint will be subject to yeah. investigation. And if it's in the opinion of the Attorney General that we have not raised justiciable issues, uh, then your complaint will die at that point. Mm -hmm. So, uh, except that you can also go to court uh, for orders of mandamus to compel, uh, but again, it's a very difficult process. And, you know, it has also constitutional immunity to make a determination 
as to whether or not um, even prosecution can go. And let us also not forget that uh, knowledge prosecutor is also there. Even once you are in court and Attorney General thinks that he doesn't want to continue the prosecution, you file a uh, notice of knowledge prosecutor, and, and that will be the end of the story. I so see. I think that where you can control your destiny is the, the, the path you have to take. And that is a, a, civil, a civil suit in the court. And that will be at your determination. Once you are able to prove your case before the court, the orders will be given by the court and directed that identified persons to be able to provide um, uh, relief mm. for your claims. In, in, uh, and so and it is a very uh, a silent area of the Constitution that is uh, seldomly exploited. Mm. And I think that I, upon advice, uh, my colleague, uh, Samit, uh, it's one area that you can look yeah. and uh, we are not allowed to advertise our services. So indeed. <laughs> but, <laughs> indeed. Uh, that's a very, very, very important uh, issue that you raise. And, and uh, 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 Prof, I bring you at this point. <coughs> this cathedral project, and we've been showing the current state of affairs at the site. We got an aerial view of what's happening at the cathedral site now. After all of these demolitions, this is it. The number of buildings that the Honorable Samuel Kutu Ablaku has indicated had to be demolished for this to be done. The cost that we have to bear as a people. But then again, the finance minister, the former finance minister and the board's proposition is that this is a strategic project that has enormous economic benefits long term while transforming Ghana into a religious hub creating jobs, accruing more revenue for the state, and so on. Is this a strategic project based on this position or a misplaced priority? I think it's absolutely a misplaced priority. And uh, I'll give some preambles, but before that, I want to say that the law needs to meet the needs and values and then the hopes of the people. So when I sit here every day and I hear that there are a lot of legal things, because law, you know, I have a lot of lawyers who teach mm -hmm. in my department, Law is a very authority course. And because if the law says this, then there's nothing that we can do. That's what the law says. Mm -hmm. But I can also say from leadership perspective that the law is the least bar in every society. Why? The moral compass, your values are higher. That is why when you break the law, you go to jail because that is the least bar everybody should clear before you live in any society. So when we are interpreting the laws, we should look at the hopes, the aspirations, and then the values for the people. Having said that, let me go to leadership. In leadership, culture is very key. Strategy is important. Innovation is imperative. Communication is vital. And execution is everything. Mm -hmm. So when the president wants to execute something and you want to use public funds, the name is very explicit, public funds. So let's educate our listeners. The president don't have cocoa farm or any coffee farm that he use money for. Before Nanado or ex-president, uh, Mahama. Mahama became president, they could not go anywhere to contract loans for Ghana. We gave them the mandate to do that, so they do everything in trust for the people. So when you are doing something, the same as members of parliament, you should, in U.S., before a congressman votes on any issue, you go back to the community and ask them what they want, before you, because you don't represent your own values there. You represent the voice of your constituents. Having said that, I think that the National Cathedral has been shrouded, one, in secrecy, two, in surprises, three, in drama, and four, in confusion. So four things that is happening here. Mm -hmm. We have secrecy, surprises, drama, and confusion. Why? I've never seen a project that is at the infant stages, just the foundation, and it's in commission. <laughs> because there are so many controversies That's around it. I know. <laughs> That's the drama piece, Andy. Mm -hmm. And then the second part is that I've also never seen a situation where board members have resigned en masse like this. Yeah. Because yeah. they were surprised by the development, and that meant that it is not where they were told from the beginning. Because we have Dougie Ward Mills, we have uh, Duncan Williams, we have a Reverend Mesa Hotel and Eastwood Anaba. Yeah or resigning from that. Having said that, we have the Public Procurement Authority who claim to have no knowledge yeah. about what is going on. And every question you give to the National Procurement Authority, they will ask you to go to the, uh, the cathedral 
uh, Secretariat and ask questions. And that raise issues mm -hmm. about the uh, identity of the country. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So so that's the drama and the confusion part. Then we have demolished buildings, over 20 demolished buildings. So that is an additional cost we talk about. Yeah. That is also part of the controversy. Then we have relocation cost, mm -hmm. which has not even been costed to be yeah. part of the original 450 yeah. now, because yeah. we were told it's going to be 100 no, million. Let's even co concentrate on that which yeah. we have paid. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we have paid, Andy, yeah. I like you very much. You yeah. see, I like honest people. Yeah. And Ghanaians don't want honesty. Yeah. So look, the situation that we need critical friends. This shouldn't even come from Sami. Sami has done a good job traveling abroad looking for. I've seen all that. Because he cares for Ghana, the money will never come to his pocket. It is mm -hmm. coming to Ghanaian pocket. Look, we are talking about a situation where the president has to sign something or think about going for loan, yeah. and because of that, he's stuck. Yeah. The money that we have, the resources, the plethora of resources we have in the bellies of our land, somebody should not be detecting things for us. Yeah. We should be rather detecting to others because we have the resources. Yeah. But unfortunately, because we mismanage our resources, then we have a problem. Now, let me go to the secrecy and the controversies. We also have lack of proper documentation. It's like you're looking for documents and you can't find them. Then we also have more questions, like Andy said, than Andy. answers. Yeah. There are many questions that are not being answered. Then we have lack of accountability, which is also one of the drama there. And then plausible professional negligence, which is also one of the issues that have not been uh, talked about. So, you know, you know, I am saddened here, sitting to hear what happened to John Kuma. Yeah. We went to Opokuwari together. He's Oh, okay. You see, he's Okatechie. And I was thinking that for the past 67 years, that Ghana have had independence. The next 67 years, what is that going to be? The next 67 years, if we don't sit up where the next generation would duck, you know, they would dig our coffin and beat us up. Because we have all this. I have a friend, uh, Dr. Benzuge, who works at Walt Disney. And he came and asked me, you know, what is the weather like in Ghana? I said, it's the dry season and the wet season. 24-7, mm -hmm. you can plant anything, put anything on the ground, and it sprouts up. Yeah. And he, what he told me, I will mm -hmm. never forget, he said, God has not been fair to us. Do you, you have been to Wisconsin, Madison, yeah. 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 that I stayed, and I built 15 yeah. leadership courses for the entire 16 technical colleges in, in Wisconsin, U.S. Wow. I built leadership courses, and they ask me every time that, what is the leadership like in Africa? Look, if we get our leadership right, for the past 67 years that we have struggled, let's think about the next 65, uh, 67 years that we think about space technology, yeah. we think about teletransport. Look, if you go to Amsterdam here, and, and even Europe, all the Schengen states, yeah. look at the way train transport. Yeah. Easy. Can't we connect all the 16 regions? Look at the jobs that that is going to create for us. Yeah. And then let's talk about health. Yeah. When, when um, this friend that I mentioned his name, what's the name? The one who just passed. John Kuma. John Kuma passed. He was a Suhum here. Suhum Regional Hospital is where they took him to. If the money that we spend every year in March pass, that people die and people just collapse. Yeah. Magafuli did the same in Tanzania, that we are not going to celebrate my, you know, Independence Anniversary because people, let me educate ourselves, that sovereignty is won at the economic front. Sovereignty, sovereignty is, won. is won at the economic front. If okay. economically you are not free, you are not sovereign. If you, uh, that is why I began this discussion by stating what my grandmother told me. He who feeds you controls you. God made us in such a way that you have to find food, you have to find, you know, place to lay your head and then something to cover your nakedness. Yeah. That is how you survive, right from the plebiscites. So when you are not able to look for food for yourself, mm -hmm. the hunters, yeah. you die because hunger is going to kill you. When you are not able to find something to cover your nakedness, of course, the vigorous weather is going to kill you. When you don't have something to cover, you know, your head, then you are in trouble. When somebody provides all these things for you, they have taken your brain away from you. And that's what a white man is doing to the black race. Mm -hmm. yes, Professor, so, so, you know, entry leaves us a lot to think about. Yes. Yes. So, Alfred, you were, you were asking for the letter. Uh, yes, for, for the termination. Day, I think I have a copy of that. I've sent you a copy. It's dated... Uh, March 14, 2022. Let's put that on the screen uh, right now. Notice of termination of appointment. And this was to all their workers. It reads, yes. due to the lack of payment from National Cathedral of Ghana, which has resulted in the project being suspended, Ribade Company Limited are required under the contract to mitigate costs mm -hmm. in compliance with such an obligation under the contract. That's what's on Ribade the Company Limited has no option but to issue this letter of notice terminating the agreement between Ribade Company Limited and you, 
as per the provisions of your employment agreement. Mm. This notice of termination takes effect on the 14th of March, 2022. That's two years ago. You are therefore requested to hand in all properties, that is safety equipment, etc., belonging to the company in your possession to the HR office <coughs> by close of work of the same day. And this is signed by Grant Ramsey, the project manager. So despite so all of this money, $58.1 mm. million, dollars, the contractor said he was not yeah. being paid and had to lay off workers, mm -hmm. had to terminate the agreement uh, with workers. Prof. So then that it raises yeah, fundamental this. questions as to yeah. where this so where did money, the money go going from, yeah. because... Well, yeah. Their constitution. yeah. Yeah. So, this, where did, this, where, so where was the money going to? The, and that's what the, this parliamentary probe you are asking for would help get answers to these questions. That is, if it is so granted. Mm -hmm. And, and even if it doesn't happen, well, the, the House speaker, has passed a yeah, resolution. The, so the business. House has passed a resolution. It's just the the the, the feet dragging. Uh, see, but I'm but warning you about the delays mm -hmm. to be associated with the process you are describing. You, okay. Now. And the possible truncation mm -hmm. of a dream. Mm -hmm. And I'm providing uh, alternative, alternative mm -hmm. that you more okay. e e efficient and where you have your fate in your hands. And where you have direct. No, no, I'm not sure to be. Hands. Hands. Andy, this it's is our it's state. It's this is yeah. our country. It's for me, country. let's be critical, friends. Yeah. The money is not you going see. to Sami or anybody. No, 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 yeah. no. It's not I, for MPP or NDC. Yeah. Let's retrieve the money to go the country we love. And I agree yeah. with you. But how do you do that? And that is why I'm describing a process of trying to you know, retrieve mm -hmm. uh, as much as possible some of these monies. Okay. We have had these con uh, conservative approaches. Uh, uh, resolutions that will end up on the shelf, nothing happens again when you have finished. And right. most cases, they become only, bring us only political dividend, not the economic dividend that mm -hmm. we so require. Uh, okay. You have proved that Andy is a, uh, Andy is a, a, a corrupt person. Uh, beyond that, you are probably better than Andy in terms of moral uprighting, and that's the end of it. So okay. what happened to all that I gained, mm -hmm. uh, you know, unlawfully. You leave it yeah. for me to go and enjoy. So I'm saying that where monies are concerned, and the Constitution has said that, it is my duty. It is, it is not only a right, it's a duty yeah. for us to work to ensure that it doesn't happen. Okay. And so, I provided the lead. The lead. So let us see more action there. And okay. let's activate the law and see where the law can bring us relief. Thank you very much. So, Niyama Amate, if you, I, I see the message that you, you sent as well. This one here um, also says, good morning, Alfred and team. Uh, uh, the discussion and the discourse this morning has been elevated in the interest of the Ghanaian people. And this is what we need uh, on a Saturday morning like this. Kudos to you and the team. Thank you very much. This one here says that Samuel Okuja Toa Blackwa must be supported in every way possible uh, to ensure that he gets to the bottom of these issues that he has raised on your platform this morning. Quite shocking to say the least. And that this one also here says that all the monies that have been used for the resettlement and the compensation to the people and the companies that have or lost their property due to the... I did not the, have a bite on that. The, yeah. I have a lot the, of information on that. Yeah. The resettlement plan yeah. and the, the whole project, the Kosovo project. No, 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 not that no, one. No, no, you're talking about the, the resettlement uh, of... No, you, uh, oh, while we end, I'll give property you... Property owners. Property. Okay, but yes. Yes. There is a <laughs> and some have gone plan. to court. Yes, yes. that's okay. Yes. Some yes. Have let, me finish, let me finish reading the message. I'll, I'll give you a couple of minutes while we end to talk about it. But this one here says that that money is for the Ghanaian people. None of the monies, not even a peswa, came from the pocket of the president or anybody in government to resettle or compensate these companies and their judges as well. This must be accounted for. The other one here says that the pit has been dug. The foundation has been dug. Buildings have been demolished. But what has to happen next? Because it's clear that this cathedral cannot be completed before the end of the term of the one who made the promise to back as President Kufado. So what happens next to this land? And that's what, that's the question. Dr. Kwame Asante, thank you for this. That's the question I asked Kujatua Blakwa, and he says there are other considerations. So there are proposals for something else to be done there. So we'll see what happens next. This one here from Prince Henry from Koforidia says, 
uh, why should President Kufuado be afraid to sign the LGBT bill to law if he believes in the mantra of Ghana beyond it? We must be committed to the development of this country in every way possible. Ken Alfestos Abuaji says, good morning, Alfred and the team. Laws have a cultural dimension and reflect societal dynamics. And uh, Okujatua Blackwell's commitment to this cathedral issue goes beyond the politics, and we must see it as such. Thank you very much for your messages. Indeed, not at all. And that's why I, I think that the messages reflect that. I'll be back shortly after this quick break. There's a, a, an, another issue that has come up we have to deal with. Very, very important. Um, but before that, Easter is here again. Book your family trip with us this uh, Easter uh, holidays. I mean, not key point, but I'm going to tell you. Uh, stay two nights and get the third night for free. Mm. Yes, this is what we are offering you, our viewers and all of you here. Stay two nights and get the third night for free with all meals exclusive, including dinner with live band every evening from 29th of March to the 1st of April. Packages offer guests free access to all the in-house facilities, swimming pool, gym, cinema, plenty of things, and uh, fun activities, including tour of our beautiful facility with an electric golf cart. You don't have to walk around. They'll help you do that. Bouncy castles, trampoline, bicycle rides, quad bike rides, boat rides to the Maha village, all of that. And I'm talking to you about the Maha Beach Resort. It's a one-stop holiday destination for everyone. Maha spelled M-A-A-H-A, -A -A, Beach okay. Resort. Go, you've been there. Where is it? It's, oh, this is in the Western region. Western region. Yes, you should make some time and go there to relax. <laughs> That's why I asked for this uh, location. Yeah. <laughs> Give them a call on 0303 I'll give you the phone numbers. Sure. Yes, and go and, go and enjoy yourself. Maha Beach Resort. Make some time and go and enjoy yourself there. Uh, can can see us here uh, on Key Point. I'll be back shortly after this quick break. It's another important issue we're getting into. Stay with us. How do I look? You look so gorgeous, Auntie. Thank you. I hope my date feels the same. Am I not forgetting something? Yes, obviously. Flora Mimi. Thank you. Can I use the washroom, please? Sure. Flora disposable blanket, you? You obviously are using flora tissues, my dear, because the flora tissues, they are soft and easy on the skin and they leave no particles. I hope you had a good time. I had fun, thank you for dinner. Are you okay? Do you want to use the washroom? Yeah. Okay, fine. Hey, broke uncle. I will tell auntie. Ah, fat chemi. I just love how it feels. Hi, baby. Hi, mom. Hope you're having fun at Granny's. Yeah, but Grandma doesn't have my favorite top chocolate chocolate spread. Hi, mom. Mommy, please, I miss top chocolate chocolate spread. Bread. Yes, it's too sweet. Made just for you and me. Choco, it's chocolate choco. It's chocolate choco. It's chocolate choco. The price you drink. Yay! Oh, the taste of chocolate. This advert is FDA approved. Hello, everyone. My name is Prince Salom. So we catch me live on this tight episode. This kind of man. Recently, you know, the stats show that across the city, but Ghana has the worst 
air quality right now. So almost a decade ago, we're told that 70% of Accra was concretized. And I don't know what they're like now. I mean, that's almost a decade ago, yeah. right? As they're coming in, the provisions are not even being made for them. Mm. So they're coming to me, the old thing, the same old things, and mm -hmm. we're all in it. Mm -hmm. Because to Keta or other areas, we have a lot of jobs that are there, but it's not really out of people to see that, oh, if I'm here, I can get this thing. <laughs> Have you ever claimed to have seen a famous Ghanaian landmark but actually just saw pictures of it on social media? Oh no, no. if you do that one, not you. The Ladies Circle shows this Saturday at 6 p.m. on TV3. Brought to you by Yaz Sanitary Pad, Onga, Yum Vita, MTN, Cowbell. Welcome back to Key Point here on TV3. We're also live on 3FM 92.7. For the second time, um, the NDC flag bearer has decided to retain Professor Nana Jenoboko Ajiman as the running mate going into election 2024 after their first uh, fight together in 2020. Uh, take a First look at attempt. Uh, attempt. Well, yes, they, they fought and... Uh, the outcome was there. So this is uh, the General Secretary of the NDC, Fifi Kwete, earlier in the week. Take a look. And he communicated to us that he was very much satisfied with the running mate that he, he went into battle with in the year 2020. And therefore, the nomination, the name for the running mate, as you know already, is Professor Nana Jane Opoku Ajima. She will be the running mate for the NDC come December 7, 2024. Well, she's not new to this position uh, as a running mate to the uh, NDC's flag bearer, John Mahama. I recall that in, in the run-up to the 2020 elections, when she was first selected, uh, someone like Kudatua Blackwell, who worked with her as, a, as a Deputy Minister of Education, listed well, what 41 achievements <laughs> um, that she was able to clock for herself as minister of education parts of this were, were also contested by the npp at the time i recall but uh, let me start off with this on you your mom the appear could be on on this choice does it <coughs> does it send shivers down your spine oh first and foremost let me congratulate uh, prof for her uh, nomination and selection uh <laughs> I want to correct one, uh, you know, impression. Me. Uh, say he was, she was selected by the uh, flag bearer. I don't think that is the situation. Under no circumstance can you alone, a flag bearer, select uh, your uh, running mate. Mm -hmm. It goes through a process, mm -hmm. and it's a process that delivers the candidate. And I want to commend the, the party generally for the smooth uh, process that generated Professor... Nana Jane. And I also want to wish her well for the fact that she carries with her, you know, traits of academia mm -hmm. into the center of decision making, which is good. And um, I think we have to also practicalize some of the policies we develop in the academic areas so that, uh, you know, academia will also make impression in, yeah. uh, in uh, national lives. So congratulations to her. Um, and particularly the consensus building, which has been the process of generating uh, a running mate. And I want my party to also learn from that process and see if we can, okay, put our heads together and find the best fit to, you know. I am not interested in the um, regional argument. I'm not interested at all yeah. mm -hmm. that yeah. somebody must come from here, come Region from there. I'm not tribe. interested. Yeah. I, but, me, well, it's that, one that you cannot also ignore. No, no. It's, it's no. part of uh, the you considerations. Are looking at the person who You're not bring, interested, but who bring, really... Yes, this is my position. Okay. Who will bring votes to the ticket? And you look beyond the voting and see the person who would be relevant in administration of the country yeah. post the election. So it is not only about uh, me coming from one region or the other. No, you look at the whole range and see 
It's good if you can balance. But for me in Ghana, it's the north-south uh, you know, uh, situation. Mm -hmm. Somebody from north, somebody from south, at least that brings uh, the country together. Right. But if you go beyond the north-south and say uh, he must be western, uh, uh, north, uh, eastern, yes. that, that one I don't like. Yeah. So let us see that somebody comes from north with a northern orientation, let somebody come and compliment with a southern orientation. Uh, beyond that, the person's capabilities, what has he achieved in life, what has she or he done in the past, what her background or his background, uh, does it support your, your own? Because you are going to compliment one person who has already been selected. So if you select somebody who is strong in law, you need somebody who is strong probably in economics, so that at least uh, in your field, you'll be able to bring some, uh, something to bear on decision making. Again, the nature of our parliament now, mm -hmm. you need somebody who will also, particularly if you are not somebody who is related to your parliament, mm -hmm. you need somebody who can also bring uh, parliament closer to the executive. Because a hard parliament like we have, yeah. It will be difficult if you don't have your parliament behind you, mm -hmm. who, whoever you are as president. So the person or persons who could bring you closer to your parliament in decision making and policy implementation is necessary. Again, you need resources into running the campaign. You need somebody who will be able to also support you somehow or be able to relate to a source of funding to be able to uh, you know iron out or oil the vehicle to victory. Uh, you know, these days, we are very concerned with religion. And religious uh, voting is also uh, the order of the day in Ghana right now. So you are looking at who are you bringing? The person, is he or she connected to a grouping mm -hmm. which is already made, like Christianity, Islam, and the like. So who is best fit for, to compliment you religious-wise? Right. You look at all those things. But above all, who is most adored by society, community, Ghanaians? And in these days, we are looking at politicians, we are saying, you may, we must come into office with a certain degree of integrity so that we will not experience that which we are complaining about. If we are complaining about um, yeah. all these things yeah. and you bring up your community, who is neck deep in the same thing, then it means you have lost the fight yes. already. Mm -hmm. So uh, bring somebody who has a certain degree of integrity and the people know that this man will not countenance this behavior. Indeed, management is working with and through people. Indeed. So the people you work with and through with, through whom you work, must be able to also withstand certain uh, characteristics that right. are you know, untoward to leadership. So, Prof, uh, I have seen her in academia in the past uh, mm -hmm. as a student leader. We engage her, and we engage her also in the Ministry of Education. So, I think this is an elevation, and repeating it means that uh, they were satisfied with his uh, performance in 2020, uh, particularly winning Central Region. I think that um, MPP should also learn from it and pick a candidate who will give a good run for her money. Because mm. uh, the more we compete amongst ourselves, it helps the better the we bring out the good persons in leadership. Certainly. And again, we are going to mark them even as they walk the distances to the, to the run-up to the election. Right. And what they do between now and December also will create an impression on all of us as to who to vote for. Indeed. MPP, my people, they, they have selected Professor Jane. Uh, she is bringing something to the ticket. Expertise. So I expect MPP to do the same. same. And let us not be fighting over one position because at the end of the day, it is one person who occupied. We all have to lend our support to that person Great. so that the ticket will be winnable. <laughs> I'm bringing the Honorable Koja to Abla. You work closely with, with, with her. In fact, no, I'll give you the last word on this matter. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Alfred, uh, I academic. know Prof. Nana so, Jane very well. Very well. She taught me at the of Cape Coast. I see. So I know her very well. We met at Ofuswampo for some mother's funeral in Koforidia, and we hugged and talked a lot about. Mm -hmm. I know her humility. She's right. very humble. She's, she's, she's a scholar. 
Uh, she wants to bring people, you know, raise people up and raise co-leaders. That's what she wants to do. I think that uh, two months before this, I had said it on many platforms, it was circulating everywhere, that it is too late to change her. Uh, because uh, the, the most expensive commodity in our world is choice. That is why even God, who created us, do not interfere in our choices. So God allow you to make the choice so that he can judge you on those choices. So I think that every leader, not that I think, but I know that a leader's choice reflects on his judgment about your capabilities. And if the president has seen her deem fit that she can handle the position, of course, the time has arrived for us to get a woman, you know, in part, because I believe women will rule the world. Now, mm -hmm. the world woman population is over 53%. So we have more women than men. If you come to America now, at the graduate school, we have 65% of the population will be women. So I keep telling them that very soon we will have the men changing diapers and the women will have the bigger jobs. So the men are staying home, the women are picking the bigger jobs and doing it. So we need to do that. But my last advice to Madam Jane, that I call her, that she will have to do more to help Jim, uh, John Mahama in this election because I want to see her going to the market, please. I want to see her interacting with the women because women like to see that, that you are part of them. Our problem as professors is that people think you are here and they cannot relate to you. But when you get closer to us, we are really down to earth. Indeed. You know, so she so. should do more to help uh, Honorable that His Excellency John Dramani Mahama for the election. Okay. But coming mm -hmm. to MPP too, we know that uh, Baumia is going to select his candidate. Uh, we've heard in the news that many people have been promised, and that is not what I'm interested in. But like Andy said, we need somebody who has the expertise and the competence to help this country move forward. For me, I don't care the party somebody belongs to. Once the, good, the roads are good, once the hospitals are good, once the schools are good, Ghana as a whole, I'm a Ghanaian. I don't believe in tribes or anything. Your tribe okay. is not better than any other tribe. Right. We are all Ghanaians. We travel with Ghana passport. What we need is to come together. We should not allow politicians to divide us. And this year, I have to say that nobody, no political party is worth a, a drop of somebody's blood in our elections. Mm -hmm. Let's have peaceful elections so that we can elect the leaders we want. Because if you elect the wrong leaders, they are going to hang on your neck as bad leaders for the next four years, and mm -hmm. the country will progress. Let's pick, because the choice is ours. Let's pick the kind of leaders who will progress this country forward. And, and that's why the consensus that appears to be um, growing at the IPAC level between the Electoral Commission and the various stakeholders is one that indeed it, it needs to be commended as well. Um, and that's what happened within the week. And, you know, that, let, let's go into Prof. Nana Jeno Pokori. And you work with her. Mm -hmm. You know her better than all of us on the, on the table. What is going to be done differently this time around? To, to, as it were, votes. bring you the votes yeah. or inch, her impact up because or it's not the first time you are bringing this ticket yeah. to the Ghanaian people. Or bring yes. Us beat. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, yes. So, so, so let me congratulate my mother, as I call her, Professor mm -hmm. Nana Jane Opokojiman. Uh, she continues to uh, make all of us proud. Those of us who uh, have had the privilege to be mentored by her. You can imagine when I was appointed her deputy and coming from the background of student leadership, uh, mm -hmm. NUC's president, you are always, you know, um, having agitations against vice chancellors and trying to get them to understand your perspective. You think that they live in an ivory tower and they look down on you <laughs> as students Indeed. and all of that. I was wondering how the chemistry was going to be. But it turned out, as uh, Prof has said, that you know, she's very, very, very down to earth, very humble, very modest, very affable. I mean, we had such a fantastic working relationship. And, you know, uh, she, she doesn't look down on anybody at all. She mm -hmm. respects everybody, regardless of age, you know, status, wherever you come from. What matters is that let's get the work done. These are our targets. Let's meet the targets. And very quietly, she, you know, she's not one of those who wants to really brag about her achievements, mm -hmm. you know, and talk about what has been done. She just wants the results to speak for right. itself. And uh, really, I think that if you go out there and you talk to the average Ghanaian, what they are looking for in leaders, integrity. They don't want leaders who will come and take things for themselves. Come and increase the national pie mm -hmm. and share it equitably so everybody will have a fair share. They want leaders 
who respect the people, leaders who will not be condescending, who will not be arrogant, who will not think that they know it all, but appreciate that knowledge cannot be in one head and that no matter how young or how, if you like, unlettered you may be classified, you also have a contribution to make and you are needed in this national reconstruction. If you talk to Ghanaians out there, they want a leader who is incorruptible. Check her career. Right from being a lecturer all the way to the first female vice chancellor of a public university to being minister of education. No adverse finding against her. No negative audit report. No scandal. Mm -hmm. She's squeaky clean. Even mm -hmm. all the way to her international appointments when she served at UNESCO two terms on the board as chancellor of the Africa Women's University in Zimbabwe, mm -hmm. as uh, head of FAWE in Kenya. Yes. No single, no iota, no scintilla of any scandal. She is just impeccably, you know, clean when it comes to making sure that the little resources she is given, she manages it to produce results. And look all around you the e-blocks, the conversion of the polytechnics to technical universities, the upgrade of the teacher training institutions to colleges of education. You know, she just delivers. Uh, the 10 uh, technical institutes she constructed at the time, one in every region, when we had 10, 10 regions, you look at how she was quite innovative introducing the private BEC. Before she became Minister of Education, you can only write one BEC and the, the, that's it. Uh, you fail, you are doomed, no opportunity to progress. She uh, uh, addressed that, that anomaly. Look at the vision to establish public universities in every region. At the time, we didn't have a, a university in the, in the Volta region. She worked to operationalize the University of Health and Allied Sciences, mm -hmm. then the University of Environment and Sustainable Development in the Eastern region. Still at the tertiary front, many people do not know that she negotiated and, and, and really worked hard to establish WACIP, the West Africa Center for um, uh, 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 Cell Biology and Infectious Pathogens. Pathogens. Mm -hmm. uh, they were very influential when it came to, to COVID, COVID, you yes. know, helping us to manage the pandemic. So she has really um, served our country well. And she makes history once again, being the uh, first female uh, to be nominated, and it was an overwhelming endorsement from the Council of Elders all the way to the neck. And if you have observed, the NDC for a long time has had a certain, you know, uh, history of changing running mates uh, mm -hmm. from, you know, Akkad to Atamels to uh, uh, Amidu, Mumuni, then Mahama. Uh, so mm -hmm. to win the confidence of everybody and be retained, it's, it's not happening in a long time, you know. And, 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 and it tells you that her humility, her affability, her work rate. I mean, people were surprised when they saw her in the last uh, electioneering campaign mm -hmm. at 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m. still campaigning, her energy, you know. And I think that she breaks all those myths that people have that, oh, you don't really send a woman to such a battlefield, all yes. of those, you know, really terrible, you know, perceptions that people have that, you know, they can't work as hard as, as men and all of those things. I think that uh, as we celebrated International Women's Day yesterday, this news is so refreshing. Mm -hmm. And uh, it shows that uh, President Mahama believes in inclusivity. He believes in, uh, in the gender movement, in allowing women, who are the majority of our population, to have a seat at the table and also to drive policy. I think that what she brings on board in terms of our political uh, fortunes, if you look at the numbers in, in, mm -hmm. in 2020, uh, her introduction helped. It increased the NDC seats in the central region from four to 13 seats. And then you also look at the presidential votes. It was halved. Uh, mm -hmm. even though we didn't win the presidential, but right. um, the, the margin was significantly reduced. And this is the first time a political party in opposition 
uh, is able to increase his parliamentary votes in a second term. Mm, if you check the numbers, it's always been the case that the ruling party increases their parliamentary majority. But this is the first time that... So you can see that the ticket, the John and Jane ticket, uh, has been a formidable one. But this is not going and, to be the and, first and, time and, you are, and, so and you are going to presenting really this. Deliver the so victory. how different will this be? So, quickly, quickly so, on that. So, so we all improve, we all uh, draw lessons from the past. I expect that uh, she will spend more time uh, engaging with people. As Prof has said, um, already there is that perception when you are a professor, a vice chancellor, uh, that you are probably uh, a bit, you know, removed mm -hmm. from yeah. the grassroots. Roots, yeah. uh, so uh, we, we, we are going to see her do more of those grassroots engagements. Uh, we are also going to see her talk to her constituency more, academia, the professionals. Uh, she's going to reach out to women's groups and uh, she's going to, you know, have a common platform and carry their issues. These are groups that have, you know, tremendous concerns and they are very, you know, analytical. So you need somebody who can relate with them at that level. Okay. And as uh, uh, Honorable and the, uh, and the appear could be said, look, for a long time, our politics has been about talkativeness and not uh, doing. Mm -hmm. um, so she comes in, she's not one who is, you know, used to that, you know, political razzmatazz and all the platform jargons and all of that. She's coming in with her academic background to help shape the president's vision and to implement and execute the mandate that the Ghanaian people will, mm -hmm. will, will afford her. And, and I think that for those who are concerned that, look, a convention has emerged where vice presidents become head of economic management team. Mm. What is economic management? Economic management really is about how you equitably share resources so all of us can benefit. So she can do that it's, job. It's, it's about looking out for our welfare. Anybody who runs a university, who is chancellor of another university in, in, in another country and is able to, you know, raise funds, mobilize resources, you know, grants and all of that and distributes it, uh, constructs more, uh, more, more facilities. Uh, it, it was at UCC that yes. she even expanded, mm -hmm. brought in the medical school, you know, and uh, brought in the UCC was able to now have its own factory for water, for even glass production and all of that. That is, you know, a university economy. Uh, how do you answer one, those as you well know? who say so, that? So, so, so it's really at the end of the day how you, you, you manage the resources. Uh, make sure that everybody gets the, their fair share. Prioritize. Mm, prioritize. Uh, if, if it's hospitals we need, if it's equipment we need, let's have it. Let's not have a situation where you go to Confuanochi and they are complaining that uh, they have only one and a half dialysis machines. Right. Uh, you go to Tet 7, they don't have their MRI functioning. You know, it's all about priorities so that you need a modest leader who is not thinking about self thinking about self-aggrandizement. Okay. But how do we make sure that these taxes we have collected, we prioritize, invest them in the right places so that the quality of life of people will improve? And I think that that's what uh, Prof will be bringing to the table. And then the, the issue of succession as well, uh, you address that as a party. Yes, Is look, look with it? yes, I, I keep hearing that concern, and that's why some people thought that President Mahama should have gone for a younger, a, person. A younger person. Maybe like But yourself. you see, what will it be? What use will it be to a yeah. younger person if the NDC comes to power and disappoints? Okay. So my response to that is that let's come to power, fulfill the people's uh, expectations, uh, meet their demands, their legitimate demands, do very well. And it wouldn't matter who you are, whether you are vice president or minister or just a member of the NDC, you will have a fair chance at winning. If we come to power and we don't do well, whether you are a young running mate, you will stand no chance. So that's how I look at these things. Samuel Okujeto Ablakwa worked with Professor Nana Jenopo Kwajman as Deputy Education Minister and then also Member of Parliament for the the <laughs> the North Town constituency is the deputy. In fact, is a ranking on the Foreign, Foreign Affairs. Affairs Committee of Parliament. One person who's led this whole charge to help resettle his people in Mepe and beyond. And I got a lot of messages in that regard, congratulating your efforts. So I think it's good that I put it all together Thank and congratulate you, you as well, uh, you. Professor.
in, 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 in made a contribution. Yes, he did. He did make a contribution. That's <laughs> true. On this platform. <laughs> yes, I think about okay. uh, some uh, substantial okay. amount of money. Oh, okay. Yes, City also Prof. Made the yes. Okay. Prof. Okay. Prof. We are I appreciate you. And I thank you so much. Yes, Prof. Okinji. And I recall that day on this same platform, the Honorable Andiapia Kubi made that very, very gracious donation. Thank you so much.